with CRE Tech and Founders Grove Capital at the Capital Factory in Austin, Texas. So I'm so excited to be bringing this live stream to you uh, because this is a first ever for CRE Tech in their series of conferences that they put on all over the country. So here's the deal. CRE Tech is where the commercial real estate industry comes to discover all things technology. And what a better place to do just that than right here in Austin, Texas. So this event brings together thousands of professionals from both the commercial real estate sector and the tech sector. And so we're going to spend about two and a half to three hours this evening going through a whole host of conversations. But our first conversation is with Josh Feinberg from Tinnevox. Josh is one of the main sponsors here this evening. And uh, Josh, I, I love your company's uh, mission, uh, which is to give leasing tenants just a better overall experience. Um, so I'm excited to hear more about your company. But first, if you don't mind, uh, let's hear a little bit about your background. Totally, and thanks for having us, we're really excited. Um, just quickly, my background, I'm straight from the dark side. I'm a commercial real estate broker. I was my own my entire career. I've been ruined since I was 20 years old. Uh, spent the first five to six years in tenant representation. Last five to six is mostly private investment, putting a deal together, which, you know, the vertical, find a piece of land, go get a tenant, get it financed, equity, keep it, raise it, whatever we want to do there. Um, and we started Tenabox roughly two years ago. We started coding about a year ago, um, and we're knee deep in it now. We're excited. Got it. So, man, that's a long time in, in the industry. What's one word to describe your overall experience in this amazing industry? Well, I'll give you two words. Uh, deal junkie. I mean, most of the great brokers that I meet, they love to do deals. And it's, it's, uh, ultimately, that's what we're here to do. Um, and that's what Tenabox is about, too, is about connecting those experiences and helping brokers, brokers transact. Helping them transact. Love it. All right. So if you could explain uh, to the audience, what was the original idea behind your company, how did the whole thing get started? Yeah, so I spent roughly in the, in the last stage of my career, I had about 12 brokers under me and we spent a ton of money on marketing, which you know, I think everybody in the room can say that that's just a common industry. I think we spent about 6 billion as an industry a year. Uh, but you know, we were spending $250,000 on I mean, really essentially newspaper traditional ads. And I remember my partner and I, we looked at the end of the year and we said, God, these are just vanity measures. <laughs> um, are we getting any real return on investment? So yeah. Tenabox is really born out of a broker need, but you know, a lot, of, a lot of things in the industry are very symptomatic. You know, let's cure this or cure that. We really wanted to cure the root. And the root of the problem, if you look at it, is really on the tenant side. It's the users. Users lack easy and accessible information uh, to a good marketplace. You know, so there's a real lack of efficiency between demand and supply. Tenabox was built to solve that. So what we do is we inform, we match, and connect users of commercial real estate, 100% free, with the best resource for their business. Whether it's the 120 million square feet in Houston, Austin that we've got, or the pre-qualified trusted vendors from tenant reps to moving companies and furniture and all those other natural touch points. Or if you just want to read, we've got a 75 page book and a 27 lesson e-course, which I encourage everybody to take. Yes, you'll learn more. Love it. All right. And so um, next question, what, what have been some successful strategies that your company has employed to, to fuel your growth? And, and if you could also um, just give a bit of an overview of the company, how, how many employees and, and how do you describe the, the size of your company? Yeah. So we've got a team of about 10, uh, seven of which are really full time. Um, and as you can imagine, we're a web company. So a lot of that software development. Uh, sure. My co-founder, Marissa Limshock, is a West Pointer. She's an army grad. She's fought in the surge. She knew a lot more than me. She's the first person I called. Um, she knows how to get stuff done. She's a true executor. Um, that's really where the idea was born and started with. Um, from there, we interviewed. We interviewed over a thousand tenants. We interviewed listing coordinators, brokers, property managers. The idea being to really create this comprehensive solution that works for both. We know that if we do our job, which is to create a great lease experience for the tenant, inform, educate them, the byproduct of that is a really great, transactable, highly aligned lead. Um, qualification is so important in commercial real estate. I can tell you there's probably 100 brokers in this room that will tell you a lead is not great. A qualified lead is. We yeah. want alignment upon the people that we're working with. You know, for example, right now, if you're a user, it's sign calls. It's, it's old, antiquated strategies. Our job is to create that efficiency, get the user the information they need, and allow them to make a better decision. That's a great point. The difference between leads and qualified leads, that's, the difference is subtle but, but huge. Yeah. than residential real estate, which is really a volume. And the demographics sure. are totally different too. For commercial real estate brokers, it's not just, I want to do every deal that comes along. It's I want to do the right deal that aligns with my experience and my needs. Tenabox uses match science, real-time algorithms to make sure that these tenants are qualifying themselves in a friendly, digestible manner, but also that the brokers are ending up on the leasing agent side are getting the people that they actually are going to transact with. Sure. And you mentioned that you ran, uh, was it over a thousand interviews? How long does something like that take? Because that is a massive amount of yeah. information that you guys have put together. About eight months we spent just testing, learning, listening, 
asking a lot of questions and getting that feedback to really, we wanted to create something comprehensive. And that's, you asked an earlier question that I didn't answer. What did we learn? Well, we learned that tenants really didn't care much about, for example, all listing sites are based around space, like A, B, C, D, E, F. Right. The tenants didn't care at step one about that suite. What they cared about was, you know, similar to if you go search for a house, do you care if it's one, two, three Main Street or one, two, five? No. I don't. Is the house in my school district that I want to be in? Is it great for my kids and my family? Is it in my budget? Can I fit it with my lender? We're making those high level sort of consumer digestible approaches to commercial real estate experiences on the leasing side. Awesome. And so could you talk a little bit about some of the challenges uh, that you guys have faced over, over the last few years? Yeah. So challenges, and I think there's a lot of companies here that would say this, is information's incredibly disaggregated. There is no MLS in commercial real estate. Um, there's no lobby for it, so there's no demand. And the licensing's all the same, too, between residential and commercial. So what we do is we actually made our marketplace, the supply side, the building side, the broker side, incredibly low barrier to entry. So it's essentially free. We only get paid for performance. Right. Um, just like a broker, all you have is your time and you work on your commission. We only get compensated and we generate you a new transaction. We learned very quickly that if we wanted great information, premium media, enhanced marketing capabilities, we had to make it easy for the other side of the marketplace, the leasing agents, the stakeholders, sure. yeah. to get in as well. And that's we learned that early and that's what's really exciting. We've got 12,000 tenant members now and 12,000 buildings. And it's time to match them up. I love it. So, man, you guys at Tenevox, y'all are doing something that has never been done before. You're a pioneer in, in this space. Um, could you comment on uh, really the, the event here today, CRE Tech, right? The combination of commercial real estate and tech. Where are we in the, the overall evolution of these two industries coming together? So we're still pretty fresh, uh, in, in our opinion. We're a new company as well, but I think there's some really established game players here. For example, CompStack is a great company, and they're really solving a big problem on the data side. Um, there's a lot of great CRMs, and I think things that are making brokers' lives more efficient. Um, Tenabox is an ambitious idea. It's an evolution. It's a challenge. It's our job to go out and solve that challenge. You know, the user is very, very important in commercial real estate. So What we're seeing is more openness on the brokerage community uh, to technology, uh, more openness from lenders and financiers. I mean, look, every building is essentially a small business and they have one job, lease space. So we feel like if we can go collect a whole bunch of users and help them, then we'll probably be in pretty good shape. I, I love that quote. Every building is essentially a small business. I'm gonna I'm gonna quote you on that. I'm probably gonna steal it as well. So Good all right, uh, we'll we'll do. All right, Josh Feinberg from Tenevox, thank you very very much. And we're gonna take a quick break and come right back with Alec Manfrey from uh, Bechtel. Bracklet. All right, and we are back. My name is Phil Wilhelm here at the CRE Tech and Founders Grove Capital event, and we are talking with Alec Manfrey. Um, Alec, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How about yourself? Doing fantastic. Well, um, you are one of the main sponsors for the event here this evening. Again, these events that CRE Tech uh, puts on across the country, they bring together 
thousands of professionals from both the commercial real estate space and the the tech space. And um, I'm excited to talk about your company yeah. um, because I'm uh, I'm very intrigued by what y'all do. I'm very intrigued also by your background, just mm -hmm. given uh, the amount of engineering, uh, academia, and, and professional accomplishments sure. that, that you have. Could you tell us a little bit about your background? Yeah, so uh, I am a graduate of Georgia Tech in mechanical engineering. Um, I think one thing that I've always prided myself on is understanding the engineering concepts behind what we do as a business, but also understanding how that relates to our business needs, uh, but also how, how it relates to software development and automation and data and trying to really bring that under one roof. And I saw you have a couple other people, I think, from Georgia Tech That's also right. on, on your team, your, yeah. C, your CTO, yeah. I, I believe. Now, what prompted the move from uh, the home of the, the Yellow Jackets That's over right. in Atlanta yeah. <laughs> all the way over here to, to Central Texas? So our story is, well, is definitely a journey. We founders, uh, uh, Matt Lynch, our chief product officer, Brian Smith, our chief technology technology officer we've been best friends since day one of college got it um, okay. so we're going on a decade of knowing each other um, but we actually got our start in a program down in Santiago Chile um, oh, nice. that that gave us forty thousand dollars to move down there work on our company and from there moved back to Atlanta got into an accelerator program here in uh, Texas in Houston and then decided to set up shop in Austin We've it. been here for about four years. That's great. So you've all been friends for a while. You've yep. had a lot of fun. You haven't killed each other. And now you're, no, you're making money yeah. together. Yeah, I joke that one way to know if you are a good fit with your co-founders is stick yourselves in a foreign country in a 500 square foot apartment and see if you guys go come out on the other side and so we did and we were stronger for it i love it well it's a bit extreme for a test <laughs> but it seems to be but it seems to be working so um all right well thank you for uh, filling us in on, on your background yeah. so now um your company can you just talk us through give us an overview of the sure. company and then what was the initial idea yeah. that, that prompted you guys to take action on yeah. this so uh, the company helps building owners. Uh, we focus on building owners with large uh, portfolios of square footage, typically over 2 million square feet, make more uh, precise decisions around where they invest their capital dollars uh, and how they can optimize their buildings using applied science. Um, and so to take that back a couple of steps, you know, the original idea was how can we use data to drive energy efficiency? And that's kind of mm -hmm. taken us on some twists and turns over the years and a lot of technology development uh, to really focus in on commercial real estate, but the need was there. Uh, buildings are a, a black box, especially when it comes to the, the building's infrastructure for owners. Sure. And they're looking to deploy capital and get returns on that capital and make sure they're driving net operating income and ultimately portfolio value. And so our tool helps them make those decisions, navigate that landscape, and take what used to be an area that they didn't have a lot of certainty over, uh, where they're writing checks and not sure what their returns are, help them make more precise decisions with the best possible analytics and data backing them. That's fantastic. And my, my next question was going to be, what did building owners do before mm -hmm. a company like yours came yeah. along? That, that sounds pretty frustrating. Yeah, so usually the way this works is when they buy a building, they get a property conditions assessment report, which is kind of like an inspection report. Hey, your chillers are pretty old. You're probably gonna have to replace them. Your controls need some upgrades. Um, and they would have engineering firms come in, bid out work, and usually it's like for like replacements. Hey, your chiller's old, let's put a newer, the newer version in. Right. But what actually uh, happens is there's tons of opportunities. There's just different options you can look at. Maybe you don't need the, the same chiller. Maybe you can actually downsize. Maybe uh, you can optimize what you already have. And so sure. when we get involved in a build and we look at uh, ecosystem of variables and we can understand their effects on one another so we can very precisely give that data and analysis to owners so they can make better and more informed decisions. Uh, man, I, I love it. This is um, science and data mm -hmm. all impacting the commercial real estate space. That's it's, right. It's very cool. Uh, could you talk a little bit about um, some of the strategies that, that you and, and your leadership team have employed yeah. to, to help fuel your company's growth? Yeah, so first is listening to customers, um, constantly getting feedback on what's going to drive a business need and what's going to drive value for for our customers. That's been paramount for us because we've pivoted a, a few times over the years. And uh, every time we pivoted, what's driven that is listening to customers, understanding their pain points and their problems, what are they trying to solve, and then understanding where our solutions and technology can really pinpoint um, uh, a solution for them. I love it. And where do you see, you've said you've pivoted a few yeah. times. What do you think the next pivot might be? Where do you think you, you need to take the company? Have you heard anything? We talked about listening and the importance sure. of listening. Um, what have you heard recently that has given you some ideas of where you might want to pivot next? Yeah, so 
We're very focused on helping owners make better decisions. Communicating that down to tenants is a key point for owners as well. Mm. Um, but what we're also doing is fundamental to not just commercial real estate, um, but also the built environment at large. Um, energy is energy, no, no matter if you're in a hospital or, or in an office building. And that's something that we take uh, seriously and we're looking you know, not just at the commercial real estate sector, but the future and seeing how our technology can be applied um, in other verticals as well. I love it, thanks for sharing that. Uh, um, so I'm sure it hasn't all been, you know, just roses and, yeah. and, and rainbows. Sure. Can you talk a little bit about the, the challenges that you guys have faced along the way? Yeah, uh, I, uh, I like to talk about a startup as being in a ro on a roller coaster. Sometimes you can go up and down in days, months and hours or minutes, <laughs> right. uh, depending on how a good customer uh, customer call goes or some feedback you get. You know, it can really change people that you can't do something and there um, and there are a lot of naysayers out there and so I think as a founder and as any company you need to try to understand it take it with a grain of salt you know think about it uh, constructively but also uh, have confidence in your vision and your perseverance um, because ultimately it comes down to what the customers are saying yeah. what they're buying and the value that, that you're bringing to them and keeping your eye on that prize is always the most important thing I, I love that you have to stay true to your to your beliefs as well mm -hmm. it sounds like you and your leadership team your belief is that better decisions can and need to be made exactly and it starts with data but data really isn't enough. You know, we like to talk about big data, um, both in the energy world, but just, you know, by and large, that's a big trend right now. I think where commercial real estate tech is going and where technology is going is taking that data and put context around it. So you don't need an analyst to sift through it. How can we apply better, smarter automation technology so we can understand what that data is telling us so then people can take action on it. Yeah. And that's one of the things we're trying to do at Bracklet. It's not just collect data, but also put it in, in context context for the unique design and characteristics of every single building. And core to that is our ability to build simulation models that accurately model the that we go into. Awesome. And then, uh, yeah, my next question is related to that. Yeah. So where do you see uh, we are today in mm -hmm. this evolution of commercial real estate and tech and, and the combination of those yeah. two industries? So I think I think it goes to what I just said. It's how how can we help? How can technology companies not only collect the data but synthesize it in a way that commercial real estate owners, brokers, um, tenants can actually make decisions off of it? Um, what we typically see is just collecting data is a great first step, mm -hmm. but if you don't have that ability to really dive deep into it, it's tough to take action on it. I think that's where we're headed uh, in commercial real estate and in an industry uh, by and large. Awesome. And we have a long way to go with these yeah. two industries, uh, but that is why we have events like CRE Tech and Founders Grove Capital. So I'm um, really excited, Alec, for the main stage and all of yeah. the, the presentations up there. Thank you very much yeah, for, thank for joining you. us. Appreciate it. All right, everybody, we're going to take a quick break and then it is out to the main stage. So stick with us for about three minutes and then we will see you on the main stage. Thanks.
start finding our seats. We're going to get started in about five minutes. Thank you. Cocktails, grab a snack. Get all in, the best view, no obstruction. Taylor, Michael, if you want to swing, swing around this way, my man, so you can get mic'd up when we're all ready to rock. Mr. Turner, thank you. Mr. Beckerman, where did he go? Okay. Well, I'd like to uh, I'd like to thank everybody for coming out this afternoon. I'm glad we got some good weather, made for some easy walks for those of you that were downtown. Um, I especially wanted to thank uh, those who traveled from out of town. I know we got quite a few folks that uh, came in from. Uh, New York and the West Coast and various parts of Texas. So uh, thanks so much uh, for coming into town for the event. Uh, really excited to uh, kick things off here in Austin, build a community around uh, a bunch of uh, exciting things that are going on in commercial real estate on the technology side. Uh, before we get started, uh, I did want to just kind of name check and thank uh, our sponsors. Uh, who were tremendous in helping us put on this event and get everything organized, uh, sponsoring the event. Uh, without them, we wouldn't be able to, to have it and to host you guys here, to have a great panel, uh, all the food and beverage. So uh, first and foremost, thank you to all of our sponsors who have helped us. Uh, I'll start so uh, with virtual app, Brian Collin. You guys should check him out. He's got a cool robot. Uh, over here after the panels, uh, so virtual apt. Uh, Taylor with Navigator CRE, where's Taylor? Wave your hand, say hello. He's right here, all right, my man Taylor. Uh, got to know him last night, uh, a college football player, so great stories there. Uh, Swivel, Billy, Billy with Swivels in the back. Thank you so much, Billy. Uh, Marissa with Tenavox. Hi, Marissa, thank you so much. Uh, Kevin and Mike with Real Massive, right over here. Uh, Austin and bringing out that crew. I know that Bo just, Bo, did you want to say just like a quick hello? I'm still on a roll. All right. I will keep rolling there. Uh, thank you, Bo, uh, for that. 
uh, for the sponsorship and just helping us get uh, organized. I guess just a little bit about me, wanted to give a um, quick introduction uh, about me and just kind of the genesis of why this event. So I have been in real estate for two years, uh, buying multifamily deals in Dallas, Fort Worth. Prior to that, uh, I was in technology selling software and hardware. And I, at the beginning of the year, I realized that I had uh, a lot of ground to make up with guys that have been in the business 10, 15, 20, you know, some odd years. And so I launched a podcast at the beginning of the year uh, called The Real Estate Innovators. And on a weekly basis, I interview commercial real estate tech founders uh, to learn about their business. And so for me, it was an education hack. I get to learn, hey, what was the big problem? How were people doing that before? Why is that a problem? And how are you changing that with technology? Um, as I started down that path and really learning about all the wonderful companies in commercial real estate tech, um, I started to get feedback from a lot of my friends who are in the brokerage community about, hey, what technology should I be paying attention to? Is there technology coming after my job? To which I, I don't know the answer to either of those, which is why I'm up here, which is why uh, I have the podcast because I'm investigating. And with that feedback from the brokerage community, it just really occurred to me that uh, creating a sense of community or a, opportunity for us to get together to have a conversation about uh, technology and how it will transform uh, commercial real estate seemed like a real good opportunity to add value and to create some new relationships. So um, that's what we're all doing here today. Uh, we've got an exciting uh, panel of folks uh, on the founder side, and we'll have a good conversation uh, around venture capital. So I did want to bring up Michael Beckerman, who is the CEO of uh, CRE Tech. And I wanted him to talk a little bit about his platform and what he's doing. Uh, and really appreciative to be able to co-host this event with Michael. So thanks, man. Yeah, thanks Appreciate so much. Thank yeah. You. No way, you got to stay here. Huge round of applause, though, seriously, for Ryan. I mean, this is. So we met uh, February of last year. I was speaking at another conference in Austin. And uh, Ryan and I met, and he's like, you got you to gotta come to Austin and have an event. And I was like, oh, you know, my team knows. I say yes to everything. I'm like, sure, okay. And he's like, and we'll have tequila. I'm like, yes, I'm definitely in. But, you know, what I seriously said to him was, you know, we, I don't really have much of a network in Austin. Um, and if, if you're willing to take the lead on this event, we'd love to support, you know, your effort and he's done just an extraordinary job in organizing this, assembling the speakers, the tequila, the venue. So I thank you, Ryan, for amazing, amazing leadership. And you don't even really have any skin in the game. Like you're not even a startup, but you are in the sense that you're embracing technology and you're doing amazing things for the ecosystem. So thank you, my friend. Um, so just really quickly, just on us, and where's my team? Where's my team? Where's my team? Where's Ann and Bethany? Where are you? Where'd you go? They're hiding. They know that I'm going to call them out. Anyway, so I am Michael Beckerman. I'm the most overexposed human being in commercial real estate technology. You're all laughing, so you obviously all agree with that. <laughs> it's the hat that gives it away. Um, so my mission, our company's mission, our passion is to bring technology to the commercial real estate industry. So it literally every single week, I am traveling around the country. I was just in Atlanta a few days ago. I go to LA next week. And we're, this is what we're doing. We're trying to expose the commercial real estate sector to the wonderful innovation that's taking place in this community. And there's some extraordinary startups here. Connell's here, Taylor's here, Brian's here. They follow us everywhere we go. We're so blessed to have all the extraordinary support of all real massive, I mean, Ari thing, I mean, everybody, City Builder. These are extraordinary startups that we're trying to expose to the commercial real estate industry. Um, so we have our own events at CRE Tech, and then we go around the country where anybody will have us, and we talk about technology and the great things that's happening in our sector. So I just want to introduce my team, Bethany and Anne, who are here with me. Where are you, ladies? Okay, come on. My amazing team, There's, there they are. These ladies put this together. They're wonderful. They do a great job. So, 
you know, just really quickly, and then I'm going to shut up. Uh, as I said, I wouldn't talk and I talk. And there's Tom from Trust, another amazing supporter. So I got started in this ecosystem in 2011-12 after a 25-year career in the public relations side of commercial real estate. And I wanted to go where the puck was headed, as Wayne Gretzky says, and I knew it was going to be technology. And 2011, 2012, I mean, crickets. We, couldn't, we were in New York. There was a handful of us. Michael Mandel from Comstock remembers. My good friend Ellie was there. I think there was about probably a dozen startups, about 30 million that I was able to subsequently go back and track that was invested in this space. This year, 2018, we track our company about 3,000 startups. Six billion is in being invested in the sector this year, domestically. So shit is happening, and it's so exciting, and we're finally starting to get some traction. But I, I applaud all of you for coming, for showing an interest, because we're still very early in the scheme of things. It's still probably the second inning. But change is coming, and it's all wonderful change. And so I applaud every single person here for coming, embracing tech, embracing change, and being part of the next revolution that's coming. And mostly, thank you to my friend. That's it. I'm out. I'm dropping the mic. Thank you, sir. So what I'd like to do next is just welcome our panelists uh, up here to the stage, and we'll just go here in order. This is uh, Michael Mandel with CompStack. Mike. Got Mr. Ryan Turner with Refine RE, just up the road in Dallas. Those woos over here are really, <laughs> those are That's good, strong. of course. Uh, Ari with Wired Score. <laughs> yes, thank you, Doug. Keep it coming. <laughs> And uh, Doug Shankman with Crexy. The biggest woo. Yeah, Doug's. The two Doug's are connecting. Okay, cool. Well, thanks, guys. We will, um, you know, we'll keep it pretty informal and, and conversational. We'll ask some questions uh, of the panel. And if you guys, uh, as we're going through this, uh, have some questions, I'll have five, ten minutes here at the end for you to ask questions of said panel. Doug, are you good with that? I am. Too. Doug's in. All right, cool. So I guess we'll just go down the line. Uh, the first thing that I'd like to just get a little bit of understanding is uh, to talk a little bit about your background and then what in your background, uh, I guess, enabled you to spot a problem that caused you to want to go solve it. Sure. Can everybody hear me okay? Um, so I'm Michael Mandel. I'm co-founder and CEO of Comstack. Um, my background is that I was a commercial real estate broker. So um, I was a broker in New York City. I was doing office leasing transactions and data center transactions and started Comstack out of my experience as a broker, uh, mainly that I was trading lease comps with other brokers all the time uh, over the phone and via email and in market meetings. Uh, and the idea for Comstack really came to me in our weekly Monday morning meeting, which many of you who, from the brokerage world probably are familiar with, mm -hmm. um, where we sat around for hours talking about deals taking place in the market. Um, at the time, I was representing creative firms like, you know, um, and tech companies, but all the deals everybody was talking about was hedge fund deals and private equity deals and law firm deals. Most of the stuff that everybody was talking about was completely irrelevant to anything I was working on. So I'm sitting in this meeting board, and meanwhile, like every Sunday night before my Monday morning meeting, I was frantically calling brokers from other firms trying to get comps to share in this meeting. You know, um, also that every brokerage firm could have our own kind of bit of the, what's going on in the market and some subset of a database. And the idea for Comstack was really just to take that offline process of people trading comps over the phone or via email or in these stupid market meetings and moving that offline process online. And that was it. And effectively, though, we made sure that we incentivize people to do it, right? Because brokers don't want to share this information under the kindness of their hearts. Um, but, you know, we created a gamified system. So effectively, you'd earn credits for sharing this data. You could use these credits to get other data back out. And it ends up being roughly one for one. For every piece of data you put in, you get another piece of data out, which actually makes it even more fair than what people are doing offline, where they're hoping that they're getting out as much as they put in. But then we also can provide, you know, a heavy layer of AI and machine learning and analyst review and what have you to make sure that the data is good quality and provide the service. Um, and then, you know, we had to make money from that. That was a free platform. It continues to be a free platform. We created an enterprise platform where we have people who subscribe to that data. And that's primarily commercial real estate investors, lenders, 
private equity firms, banks, and now we have some of the world's you know, leading commercial real estate investors and lenders and people like that who pay for access to our data, uh, people like Wells Fargo, JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, Blackstone, BlackRock, you know, what have you. Um, and they make real estate investment decisions and lending decisions based on the data. Awesome. Mr. Turner? Cool. Uh, yeah, my name is Ryan Turner, founder and CEO of Refinery. I think we're the youngest company up here. Um, we've only been around for about a year. Um, you know, going back to the beginning of the problem, you know, I was a broker for almost 15 years. I was at JLL in Chicago, focused on, you know, large tenant rep ten transactions, headquarters type deals. Moved down to Dallas with CBRE, uh, head of business development for their global corporate solutions team. Um, and that's really where I started to see this problem it was in that multi-market space. So we provide portfolio intelligence for occupiers, for tenants, um, you know, especially ones that occupy multiple locations. We found that you'd walk into these, these companies, I don't care if it was AT&T and IBM or on down to you know, lower middle market, they had no idea where their leased assets were and how it all really worked together as a network with one another. Um, so we simplify that data, you know, turn it into something they can actually make decisions off of, not just an Excel spreadsheet. Um, what gave me the kind of the, the, the keys to this was really when I was at CB, Ellie Feingold's over here somewhere. Um, Ellie was, was running a, a group called CBRE Labs, and we would go in and, and do these ideation sessions um, and help them think through problems from a technology perspective. And it opened my eyes and just really got me thinking. Uh, and I kind of raised my hand at CB and said, I want to learn how technology can start to solve these problems. Um, and then it just kind of grew from there. And so that was probably five years ago. So uh, excited to be here, humbled to be here with all these guys. Yeah, thank you. Ari? Cool. Hey, everyone. I'm Ari Berendrecht. Um, I think I run one of the oldest companies up here, but uh, this, is one of, this is my first time wearing a Taylor Swift-esque microphone <laughs> thing. I know it looks very natural on me, but uh, yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> so uh, I run a company called Wired Score. We are a certification for office buildings. And we measure the quality of the internet connectivity and digital infrastructure in the office building. So you can think similar to LEED or Energy Star, but instead of focused on sustainability or energy efficiency, we are measuring telecommunications. Um, the impetus for the idea it was, it was just the fact that um, connectivity is becoming more and more important to all occupiers today, all types of businesses, not just tech companies. Um, and in New York, where I'm based, I started hearing like the internet really sucks in New York City. And I heard this from friends on the landlord side and from friends on the tenant side um, that run, run their own startups or, or, or medium-sized businesses. And I'm not from real estate or telecommunications, unfortunately, but it seemed very strange to me that a city like New York could have a problem with something so fundamental um, as internet connectivity. And as I dug in, I realized that there are some buildings that have great digital infrastructure and some buildings that have bad, in, bad digital infrastructure. But what's universal is that it's impossible to tell when you're looking for office space which one of those two kinds of buildings you're looking at. It's like tucked beneath the surface, under the hood, you know, in the dark corners of the building. And on a space tour, when you're seeing the views in the coffee shop and the fitness center, you don't actually know how good the internet is. Um, so the idea for Wired Score is to make that more transparent. And when people are looking for office space, they can target Wired Score buildings, and they'll know that they'll have great digital infrastructure for their business. Um, last thing I'll say is that here in Austin, um, we have about 27 buildings that have adopted the Wired Score standard. Um, local owners like Brandywine, TA Realty, um, Brandywine in the house, I see, <laughs> nice. Um, Endeavor. Um, I can't believe I'm forgetting the rest of the list, but it's about 5 million square feet of office space. Alliance Stone is another big adopter here in Austin. So super happy to be here and, and to meet everybody. Awesome. Thanks so much. Doug? Awesome. I'm Doug Shankman. Um, hopefully this works. Your Taylor Swift analogy is on. Um, <laughs> I lead the uh, sales team for Corexy. Uh, my past is I spent a 10-year at JLL, five in Chicago, and the last uh, five in uh, Los Angeles. And really what I uncovered being a broker was the age old problem of supply and demand. I didn't understand why it was so difficult and we didn't understand why it was so difficult to find all the inventory through the other marketplaces. Brokerage for us was a bit siloed with using tools like a MailChimp, a constant contact, a Dropbox. 
And what Crexy aims to accomplish is including everything within one space. We launched it just in the for sale opportunity where it's an open marketplace that connects buyers and sellers and more recently went into uh, the leasing space. Um, but everything for us is under one hood. So we have a replacement from a marketing avenue, from a MailChimp and Constant Contact, from a war room capabilities, we have a replacement to electronically execute CAs and offer due diligence capabilities. And we want to streamline the process for the brokers so ultimately they can do what they do best, business development. So that's where we sit today. We brought in about 100,000 plus for sale offerings to market. We've been in business for about three years and we average a little over 2 million page views per month. So we're, we're hoping to take down uh, the monopoly that's currently in place that I'm sure we all know and love. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, who's that? Excelligent? Uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Throwing darts. Here we go. Um, so I'll, I'll start with you, Doug. I think, as I mentioned in the beginning, you know, the impetus for putting this event together was a lot of friends who uh, are in the brokerage community, and a lot of your growth depends upon, or I guess really the growth uh, here on stage depends uh, upon changing habits and a changing kind of procedure for how people go to market, how people service their clients, and what their day-to-day -day looks like. Can you talk just a little bit about um, you know, growth or any challenges that you have along the way and changing some of um, you know, that approach and brokerage? Yeah, I mean, I think for us, commercial real estate, uh, and that's probably why we're all here from a technological perspective, is, is a pretty antiquated industry. Uh, we saw tremendous growth in residential, uh, but commercial kind of got left behind, and it's uh, the age-old habit of teaching an old dog new tricks, uh, which has been interesting and it's been a challenge. But I will say we are a, a supplemental resource for brokers to streamline the process. And what we have had to do with regards to kind of promoting our product and offering is just make the brokers aware of the tools. So instead of a broker being reactive and waiting for the phone to ring through the other marketplaces, our, our engineers created a dashboard for each brokers, which allowed them to see transparently who's visiting the site, who's interacting with the site, download lead reports to get the full contact information. So it puts the brokers in a more proactive situation to sell the deals, which is where we want them to live inevitably so they can grab the contacts for their database and close more deals in a quicker time frame. Cool. Michael, you want to comment on just kind of growth or changing some habits between, you know, what is an age old tradition of just trading those comps and the Monday morning meeting? Well, I think for us, you know, um, Brokers were so used to feeling like a real estate data company or a tech data or tech company that wants to work with them ultimately really wants to screw them. And, um, you know, I, I can't imagine why that might be the case. Um, and so ultimately, you know, we, you know, we built a platform that relies on brokers trusting us and liking us. And we have to actually keep the brokers happy in order to have our platform work. But I think the biggest barrier for us was them being like, wait a minute, what's the catch? Like, you're giving me data. You're not going to, we're going to give you data and you're not going to charge me. And I'm going to be able to get value out of this. You know, like, what am I missing? You know, and actually having to really, you know, explain to people what the business model is, how we make money, how it works, and why we're not going to screw them it was kind of the main, the most important thing, I think, to get buy-in. And also, I think, you know, um, we have often been described in the industry as a disruptor, and we don't want to be thought of as a disruptor. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we fundamentally, our whole, you know, thesis was around taking something that was done offline and just moving it online and trying to really not be disruptive at all, but really more transformative and help the industry. And so, <laughs> We've been, you know, it's always been like, no, we're not disrupting what you do. We're just helping you do what you do better. That's kind of been the hardest part. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, Ari, and, and I guess talk a little bit about from a broker's perspective, how, you know, maybe Wired Score is new to some folks or they're engaging with it in some way. You know, how should that community kind of think of, of Wired Score or, or just leverage the technology? Yeah, absolutely. So, so our customer are the developers of new office buildings or the, the operators of existing occupied buildings like this. Um, landlords pay Wired Score to come in and evaluate their the, techno the in-building technology and connectivity so we can recommend for them how to improve it. Um, and if they have great tech, we can help showcase that through our certification. 
Um, we spend a lot of time with brokers not to sell brokers anything, um, but just to educate and create awareness as to what Wired Score means. And when, if you're a tenant rep and you um, are trying to provide good, good service to your tenant and find them in the right space, Wired Score information and the information we uncover um, is probably valuable for you to be able to, to articulate and share with your client. Um, on the leasing agency side, the same thing. Um, you know, this is information that a CTO is going to want to know before someone signs a lease. And if a leasing agent can, can share really clear, important information about the technology in the building, that's going to go a long way. And as a broker, how is that information available? How do I access that or, or leverage it? Yeah, we're, we're doing our best to make it as publicly available as possible. Um, you can find Wirescore information on CoStar, sorry to say. <laughs> um, but we're sharing it with, with a bunch of other um, databases and places where people go to get information you'll, about real estate. You'll see it on Comstack. Yeah, as soon as, as soon as Michael and I get that done, I'll stop saying CoStar and start saying Comstack at that, at that part helpful. of the, the presentation. Did, um, I, did I preempt the end? Sorry. No, yeah, now our press is ruined on that. <laughs> <laughs> the big unveil. All right, and uh, Ryan, I guess, you know, you're a year in. What has been the challenge or kind of the uptick to, to really get a, ahead of steam? Yeah, I think uh, every startup's problem, biggest problem is obscurity. Nobody knows who you are, what you do. And distilling that message down into something simple is a lot harder than it sounds, um, especially when you're dealing with something in an ecosystem as complicated as commercial real estate. You know, we've got so many different players and the incentives are so backwards and upside down that it's really hard to convey how we deliver value um, for our customers and for the other pieces of the value chain, you know, the brokers that we work with along the way. How can we help them win, keep, and grow business? So getting that message out in a, in a clear way is tough. Um, Refinery got lucky. We're part of the Collier's PropTech Accelerator in Toronto. Um, doesn't mean we're owned by Collier's or anything like that. But um, you know, working with, with really smart startups from around the globe, um, we've gotten to see some, some pretty interesting things. And what I've, the thing I keep coming back to is that people are still really important to this process. Um, you can throw a bunch of tech at things, but everybody's kind of overshooting a little bit and pulling back and throwing more people into it. Um, which is what we're doing with our customer success and those types of things. So that's been really interesting for me to learn is tech doesn't solve all the problems. Yeah. And could you talk just a little bit about, you know, just a brief highlight on user experience? So I know it's portfolio intelligence and helping somebody who's got, you know, properties across the country or just, you know, geography dispersed. What is that user experience as a broker? Like, how do you kind of change the game for those guys? Yeah, well, I think, you know, everybody's used to the old clunky systems. You know, lease administration was built to pay rent. Uh, other tools were meant to do other functions. Nothing was really meant to, to be a strategy tool. And there's no industry standard platform for occupiers of commercial real estate. So um, we try to make it really look good, look sharp, look sexy. You know, we want the brokers to shine. We always joke that we're in the hero business. You know, that, that you go in there and you look like a hero or the end user, the client looks like a hero because they're showing their boss something they've never seen before that's really visual. It looks nice. It took them four clicks to do it, but it's making them shine. Um, that was kind of the key to drawing attention to it. But then you've got to have the meat behind it to back all that up and make it so it's not just, you know, a shiny object, a pretty tool. And is your, is your ultimate customer or client, is, is it the broker? Are you selling to brokerage shops? Is it uh, the end user whose portfolio needs management? <laughs> like, how, how does that interaction yes. um, collide? <laughs> the answer is yes. Um, so we've kind of, you know, brokers are obviously an, an awesome channel for us. In a great, and if we think we can help them win, keep, and grow business, um, then we're going to be valuable to them, not just the end user. You know, we, we started off thinking, you know, I was a broker, I was like, who needs more brokers? We can just be valuable to the end user. They'll jump in line. Not really the case. So we've had to figure out the different pieces of that along the chain and deliver to each individual customer. So it's that director of real estate, VP of real estate, who's got a million fires to put out and wants to understand how to optimize their portfolio. But it's also that brokers, how can we help them shine in the sales pitch when they show up? Um, instead of just banging their fists on the table saying, we're different, we're different, we're different. We've all done it as brokers, and it, it doesn't really work all the time. I'd like to get your, uh, I guess, the group's thought or the panel's thought about where we are. I hear a lot of uh, conversation around commercial real estate tech that, hey, we're in the first or second inning. 
Uh, you guys all have a little bit of experience uh, either coming out of the brokerage world or a lot of experience working with brokers. Uh, I'd love to just get some insight from you just about that space and brokerage and where we are and kind of where we're headed. Uh, I, I, Ari, you've kind of got an outside view looking in. Yeah. Uh, maybe we'll start with you. I mean, I think it, the industry as a whole, real estate tech, is obviously maturing, as Michael said. Um, I think the standpoint of a lot of, of our clients, landlords or brokerages, like people are getting bombarded by real estate tech companies and are trying to figure out how to put up the appropriate filters or screens or funnels to identify the, the key tools and services they need to do their jobs more effectively um, and weed out the other hundreds of real estate tech companies that are popping up. So I think it's a little bit of a messy time in real estate tech because of the, the um, sudden proliferation of, of companies trying to solve problems. Uh, my advice to startups is usually try to solve a, a top 10 problem for your, your key constituency, whether it's a broker or a tenant or a landlord. Um, that might sound obvious, but a lot of people think to them, like, have a great business idea, but if you really pressure test it, it's the top 25 problem. Um, and I think that's kind of the key to, to get through the, the noise of all the real estate tech companies that are probably peppering a lot of the people in this audience to use their tools and, and data and other systems. Do you have any advice for the folks that are getting bombarded? What kind of filter, where, you know, where should they start? What should they look for? As Michael say, 3,000 companies in 2018? I mean, it's a, what kind of filter should I be creating? Yeah, I mean, it's a good, it's a good question for the next panel as investors, I think. Um, the question we get asked all the time is, is like, how can, like to Wired Score, how can you articulate your ROI? And everybody wants us to be more ROI driven and led and really, really be clear when I'm talking to a room full of brokers, like why should you pay attention to what I'm saying for five minutes? Is it gonna help you look smarter to your client? Is it gonna help you close deals faster? Um, is it gonna help you raise rent? And just to be really specific about how you're driving value, um, I don't think Wired Score did that very well in its first couple months or year, and we spend a lot of time thinking about how to simplify our ROI messaging. Cool, R Ryan. I guess you know you're kind of early in the in the stage yourself. So just back to that kind of first or second inning uh, kind of commentary about where we are in the space and you know kind of impact to the brokerage community. Yeah, I mean, I think we're trying to catch up, right? It's it's there's so much going on out there, and there's. We're not inventing new tech necessarily. We're just applying things to our industry that have been needed to be done for a long time. You know, we hear this dinosaur industry constantly. Um, so it's really nascent. It's really early. Something as simple as, you know, getting a company off of Excel spreadsheets to manage their second largest expense, you know, where they're spending 30, 40, $100 million a year on rent, yet they can't find where all that rent went and how it works with one another. Um, so I think it's really, really early. I love seeing it all come together and the different solutions that we're working towards, but there is a lot of noise out there and it's hard to get through. Uh, we're facing those challenges all the time. Any thoughts or suggestions on filtering through that noise? I think the obvious things kind of come to the top. You know, I think there will be more platforms. There's a lot of tools, I call them, you know, the, and we always say that we're not, a, we're not a shovel, we're a construction firm. Um, so I think that we'll see more of that and these kind of things banding together. I wear my CompStack socks today. Nice. Um, Amazing. In support, <laughs> in support of, of, of partners out there. You know, I think it's, that's, that's what's going <laughs> to happen is that this stuff's going to come together. To It's not a top 10 problem all the time, but if you put, you know, four 12s together, um, you start to solve more, <laughs> more issues. Is that not? Yeah. My math isn't right there, but uh, I think that that's what we're going to see more and more of. Yeah. Cool. Michael, you commentary on just where we are in the space and... Yeah, I, I didn't pay him to do that, by the way, um, <laughs> but uh, I appreciate it. Um, but you do owe him money. <laughs> <laughs> so now I do. Um, so, I don't know, I effectively almost feel like we're playing a new game, but the old game is still kind of haven't, hasn't finished. You know, it's like, you know, the... And I'm hoping that we're in the eighth or ninth inning of the old game, and that's about to come to an end, because the, the truth of the matter is, when we go and pitch real estate investors who primarily pay for our data or lenders, they're not talking to me about the, the other, other startups in the space. You know, the budgets that they have are allocated like, you know, almost entirely to CoStar and a little bit to Real Capital Analytics and a tiny, tiny bit to Reese, at least in the real estate data space, and nobody else even comes up. So, you know, 
you know, I, I feel like we're living in less of a bubble than we were a couple of years ago. There's a lot more people in the audience today that are actually real estate people and not just real estate tech people. But um, there is still a long way to go. And I, I think we're becoming more top of mind. And I also think like, you know, to our advantage, you know, they know we're out there. They may not even know what all of us are doing, but they know there's something better out there and they know what they've got sucks and they're angry about it. So, um, like, I, I think that there's like a real opportunity in that regard. We've definitely finally seen customers that have turned away from, you know, a large company I, I won't name that, that frankly does stuff that we don't do, but just because they're so angry about them, they're going to live without the stuff that they don't, that they do that we don't because they just don't want to deal with them anymore. And so I think that, like, hopefully the end of the old game is, is at an end. And where we are in the new one, I'm not sure. But we probably still have a long way to go. Sounds like we got late night extra innings going on. There's some frustration. Potentially. Potentially. <laughs> right. In this game, Doug, this, uh, you just comment on where we are today. This and wouldn't be a real estate panel if the inning analogy wasn't used. Yes. So, right. Michael started it off. I, I actually, I think we're in the middle innings. Um, I say that because the, the space is getting pretty crowded. Um, and I think um, for us, at least over the next 12 to 24 months, there will be a lot of um, potential partnerships, acquisitions, and consolidations. I think of a lot of new players that are entering this space potentially will pivot into uh, more of a blockchain type of uh, arrangement or whatever the new hottest industry is. Um, but I do think partnerships are the way to take down um, the unnamed um, company. <laughs> And we're, uh, we're exploring all avenues of that. And we've experienced uh, this similar type of conversations with uh, people looking for alternatives and actively seeking that alternative. And even though we can't deliver um, the data arm yet of it, um, that is, uh, you know, those are opportunities that they just don't want to work with that business anymore. So uh, we're playing on that. And I think it'll be interesting to see what happens uh, as AI and, um, you know, blockchain, if it becomes a real thing, come to reality. Yeah. And what's your advice in terms of that filter or, you know, your brokerage and you're frustrated or you're looking just to explore technology that can create efficiency or a better customer experience for your clients? Yeah. I mean, my advice is Crexy, obviously, first and foremost. <laughs> right. Um, ch check us out. Yes. Um, but no, I mean, I think there's a lot of noise. And I think uh, for us and for the other panelists on um, the board, it, it's all about stability and funding and monetization so you can continue to grow. And um, it's a race uh, for sure. Um, I think at the end of this, there's going to only be a few companies that stand and a lot of the partnerships will accelerate um, those companies to the top. Okay. We're an exciting time today. We've got about 10 minutes left with these panelists. I did just want to pause and see uh, if there are any questions from the audience, if anybody had uh, anything that they would like to ask. Yes, Bo. How many do out there would love to be purchased by <laughs> Gotcha. So, uh, I <laughs> so I guess the question is, um, I guess more broadly speaking, <laughs> who's building a company with eyes on a acquisition, uh, regardless of aforementioned name not to be named? Yeah, just be careful for anyone. <laughs> <laughs> We're going for IPO. Um, we, we envision trying to be the Airbnb type model. Our model is based very similar to LinkedIn where there's a 100% free version and then a premium version. So IPO is our end game. Cool. Ari? Yeah, we, we, our type of business is pretty unique as a certification business. We have a lot of room to grow, not just globally. We're only in six countries now. We want to be everywhere, um, but in other asset classes. So we want to have wired score when you're looking for apartments so you can compare internet. Um, so we're pretty heads down on, on that path for now. I need wired score at my house. I can do that. It's, it's terrible. I get so many calls to fix people's internet, which I'm totally <laughs> ill-equipped to do. All right. Um, so if anyone needs any advice, you can ask so me. It's like your friend who works at Amazon whose family member needs help returning a package. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, Ryan? Yeah, you know, they always say to begin with the end in mind, but we're still raising Series A. Um, so acquisition and, and exit isn't really on my radar. We're trying to build the best company we can uh, with the most revenue we can. I think what I see though is everything, everybody we talk to is like, oh, so it's a data play. Oh, it's a data play. And there's a lot of focus on that. Um, we want to be really valuable along the way though. And, and yeah, we gather a bunch of data at the end of it. Um, so I don't know. I don't know what the answer is going to be. There's, 
probably something we haven't even thought of yet that's more in line for us. That's maybe, you know, amalgamating the different technologies that have come along in our little corner of the universe. Because uh, I don't think we're, we're anywhere near uh, what this market should look like. Michael? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're focused on building a big business. And um, we, you know, our business is somewhat unique in that, you know, we gather a lot of data for free and then we sell it for a good amount of money. Um, whereas, you know, CoStar has 1,800 full-time, you know, cold callers calling for data. You know, we have 16,000 members who give us data for free. So it's very efficient, which means that, you know, at scale, it can generate a lot of cash, which, you know, um, so we, I, I hope that we have a lot of optionality to do whatever we want long term. Um, you know, that said, what we do is we stay close to a lot of the big companies that could either be partners or acquirers. And, you know, we're not looking to be sold. We're looking to build a big company. But I think our investors feel good about the fact that we're partnered with industry leaders like Moody's as a partner and an investor in us, uh, RealPage as a partner and an investor in us. And so um, that gives us the ability to partner with these guys and see where it goes. And more than anything, I think we're interested in having them as an investors so that we're strategically aligned. I really like that a lot because it helps means that they're invested in our success and it allows us to really, you know, have control over what our what our you know outcome is. Cool. Uh, yes, sir. The gentleman in the back. Uh, you're the gentleman in the back. <laughs> <That's you. laughs> Not way back, just middle back. Yes. <laughs> Uh, I've, I've got your emails, I've registered with your company, and a long-time broker, um, Texas is a non-disclosure state, Sure. and it is for a reason. The buyers and the sellers reps don't, or the buyers and sellers don't want anybody to know what they bought or sold these property for, and as a broker, my question is, uh, I'd love to give you all the information I have, but what's my liability and how do you get around it? Sure. Well, so look, I think realistically, you're probably already sharing that data. Are you? I mean, tell me, like, do you share? Do you share that data with other brokers? Do you share that data in market meetings? What's that? What's that? That other company? I just told. No, not the other company. With other brokers. Do you share that with other brokers? You you a broker? Sometimes. <laughs> I mean, that's the that's the reality, right? I mean, everybody's already sharing this data. Um, there isn't data on CompStack that is that we are all of a sudden, you know, making the world available of data that isn't out there. It's out there. It's just we're the only people compiling it in any sort of comprehensive way. You know, that said, our members are anonymous. Um, and the other thing is that our members, you know, we ask our members via our terms of use not to share data with us that they're legally or contractually bound from providing. So our assumption is that you're sharing data you're allowed to share. That said, we don't believe that this kind of data is actually confidential information because the standard for confidential information is that it's proprietary and non-public. We get every deal on CompStack an average of three times. In our most developed market, New York, we get every lease comp an average of 10 times. I think it's pretty hard to argue that that information is proprietary and non-public when we get it 10 times over. Yeah. So um, I, don't, I don't believe that it's confidential information. <laughs> All right, a little side stage direction from Doug. Thank you, JT. I'm curious what percentage of comps you feel like you guys get in the, I mean, maybe more New York than other markets, but I mean, kind of on average, what percentage of comps do you feel like you guys capture? It, it, mark, it, it varies a lot market by market. So like in New York, I think we have close to 100%. Um, it's, it's hard to say because there is no standard for how many deals have taken place. There's nowhere we could go with it as a registry of all the deals that took place. You know, we're the closest thing to that. So we do try to estimate it by looking at like average lease term and how many square feet have maybe transacted and, um, and kind of estimate it. You know, I would say across our markets, across the U.S., you know, we try not to launch a market with less than 50% of the transactions over the last year or two, which now we're pretty much everywhere. So we've got roughly that threshold, you know, in most places and, you know, up to 100% in, in our more established, bigger markets. But the nice thing about crowdsourcing and the network effect is that it gets better and better every day. The more people that are on the platform, it can't really get worse, assuming that it's working. So, yeah. Awesome. Uh, Jesse. All right. Hey, uh, Doug, Doug be cool, man. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Um, out, of, out of curiosity, just what segment tends to be the, the best in terms of adoption? Is it brokers? Is it owners? Or is it occupiers? And then within those segments, who do you typically sell to? I mean, who are, who's spearheading the movement to bring on the, the platform to that, that use? 
For us, uh, we sell to brokers. It's an open marketplace. It's free to list and free uh, for buyers to search. Uh, we don't hide any listings um, and are monetize. We monetize for sale brokers. And most difficult for us is the, the um, acquisition of the buyers today. It looks a whole lot different than it did five years ago. It's predominantly taking place in the digital space with SEO and keywords and all that good stuff. Um, so that's how we're going to monetize. It'll always be free for buyers to search. Uh, we don't understand why um, individuals would charge buyers or tenants when ultimately they're going to drive the transaction one way or another. I can answer quickly, although my, my clients are obviously landlords. Um, we, we do get a lot more inbound interest about what we do from the landlord community. Um, I think because there's a shift um, happening within real estate that is turning commercial office owners into hospitality providers. Um, in my world of technology and connectivity, that means internet's not a tenant problem. The landlord has some responsibility for providing a, an amazing environment. Um, so a big question on the landlord mind, usually asset managers who are responsible for delivering on a, on a P&L and on a, on a you know, successful um, financial, uh, the asset successfully financially, um, asset managers are worried about losing tenants and they're worried about not filling space fast enough. And that's where we get calls um, to learn about what we do. With brokers, I think our challenge is even if a broker knows that putting their client in a wired score building is a better home for them. Sometimes brokers don't want to complicate the deal. They don't want to bring up something that is, you know, a factor that introduces another question mark, another round of conversation. Um, so the battle I fight with the brokerage community is convincing folks that, um, you know, educating your clients on connectivity in which buildings have, have great technology will make you be a better service provider, even if it raises another issue for, for discussion. Got time? <laughs> yeah, I think um, so. We sell to end users, you know, that director of real estate, VP of real estate, um, corporation, um, which is really more complicated. Um, you know, even though I sold to them as a broker for 15 years, there's no tenant convention. They're not all in one place. <laughs> totally fragmented. Should work on that. Um, you know, so that that's really tough. And we're selling a SaaS product to people that have never bought SaaS before. So that's also a complication. There's a big education that's happened there. Brokers. Um, you know, uh, I love selling to brokers because we're selling to revenue. We're going to help you make more money. We're going to help you win, help you keep your business, grow your business. So that's a lot easier of a sell. Um, Adoption is a whole other issue, um, but we're working on it. Cool. I'm, I'm going to disagree a little bit about selling to brokers. I think selling to brokers, I mean, we haven't really tried it in a meaningful way just because of my experience as a broker. It just didn't seem like a happy road. I mean, the problem with selling to brokers, I mean, now granted, if you can explicitly show how they're going to make money, I think you can do it. Or if you're going to give, you know, if you're going to give them commission somehow, you know, like, like Crexy and you're like, okay, you know, this is how you do your deals on our platform. Sure. But otherwise, I mean, selling to brokers are challenging because like, the individual brokers are like, oh, well, the firm should pay for that. And then the firm says, no, my broker should pay for that. And you're just stuck in the middle as a vendor. So it's like challenging to try to make that work. Um, you know, we, we primarily, then we, you know, we rely on brokers for the data. So we stay away from selling to them for that reason. But, um, you know, we sell into investors, lenders, private equity funds, insurance companies, sovereign wealth funds, hedge funds. Um, the, um, you know, but I think you asked specifically kind of like who, what type of people do you sell to? I mean, for us, um, you know, we sell into the actual teams that would use the, 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 um, the tool. So we sell into asset management teams and leasing teams and acquisitions teams and, and lending teams. And we have to try to sell into the individual users who are often analysts and associates that would use the platform on a day-to-day -day basis and simultaneously sell into their bosses. Um, we don't typically sell into like IT or procurement directly. You know, we, sometimes we get pushed to procurement, but not you know, but we tried to make a tool that doesn't require a lot of like enablement by the IT people so that we at least don't have to deal with that barrier. I'm going to do, Doug was so patient here and he looks frustrated for some reason. I, are you frustrated? One good question and then we're going to wrap it up. These guys have a tremendous uh, perspective on the market, what's going on in a broad reach. Uh, so we're going to have a networking session after the VC guys come up. I would encourage you to reach out and introduce yourself uh, and pick their brain. Doug, final question. So a couple of years ago, I heard that... Uh, Is this a story or a question? <laughs> 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 <laughs>
I'm curious. So, like, something like 84% of the global accounting was done by the top four, right? And there was, like, a comparative stat that, like, 17% of the global real estate was done by the top four. So, call it CBRE, Cushman, JLL, and Colliers. Um, <laughs> What, what do y'all see as the gap there? Because I used to be at a local firm, and there's something there. Do y'all see the local or the international, and does that consolidation help or hurt CRE tech? Anybody want to take that one? <laughs> wow. Well, um, Doug stomps the panel, drops the mic. Yeah. We are ready to go. I, I mean, I'm curious. Oh. Uh, no, yeah. So no, if you look at like JLL's annual report that came out a couple weeks ago, it said that 80% of the market still isn't using a broker um, globally. Um, wow. You know, Collier's looks at it the same way. They said that you know the big five only have like 18% market share. Um, we see a lot of smaller shops out there doing different things, and that's I think that's all great. Um, the consolidation has driven tech in the past, but it hasn't really worked. Um, and every shop's doing their own and spending a bunch of money on it. And I think they're all starting to come around now. You know, I don't know where this goes, and it doesn't really directly answer your question, but I think that they're all at least realizing there's an opportunity for best in class, and that's better for everybody, not just the big four. Well, I, and that, I think the fragmentation, sorry, I cut you. No, go ahead. I think the fragmentation is actually good for tech because it, it, you know, it means that we can, if we can create something that all the other 80% want to use, yeah. then you know, we'll become the de facto platform and have the resources to become the platform that's significantly better than the big firms use. So you know, tech, technology can help level the playing field you know, in, a, in a meaningful way. Um, but you know, if, if the big companies embrace it, which I hope they will, then it doesn't level the playing field because they'll still, if they're ahead of the curve on it, they can reaffirm their competitive advantage by being ahead of the curve. It's just you know, they have to get past their own egos to do that. And that's highly difficult within the world of brokerage. Um, so, <laughs> but no, but like that's honestly the way corp like corporate often is in some of these firms. But I, I, maybe I, I say too much what I think. Um, but um, <laughs> Ari, did you want to? Uh, I was just going to tack on. I mean, the, one, the final one, word from Ari. The one good thing about the big shops is is obviously like JLL's raised a hundred million dollar CRE tech fund. CBRE is a huge investor in in Fifth Wall as an LP. Um, and so they're trying. They're trying to push the boundary on on tech adoption within brokerage. Um, I I think who knows how well that goes because even getting investment from those guys doesn't actually mean that they're going to adopt your technology. Um, but it's a baby step forward. I think. Cool. Big round of applause for the panelists. So, so big thank you. Ari and Michael flew in from New York. Doug flew in from LA. Ryan from Dallas. Make sure that you reach out and introduce yourself. I'm going to invite uh, Michael Beckerman up to the stage. Okay, so I'm going to have... Yeah, it's good to see you too. It's yeah. been a while. I've been like... How are we doing? <laughs> All right, so um, <laughs> you two. I would, I would have a tequila in my hand, but there's some cameras, and my 13-year-old follows me on Instagram now, so I got I to gotta be good. Anyway, so question. we could we could do that. Uh, so anyway, so listen, I'm going to have a, a short Q&A with my friend uh, Ellie Feingold. So, one of the things that I do a lot of with my own presentations is sort of give a overview of where we are in the CRE tech sector and uh, talk about like major trends and, and uh, what the future looks like. And a lot of times when I'm sort of giving my speeches or whatever, 
these are to new audiences. So how many people here have ever been to a commercial real estate tech conference? Forget you two. Right. It's great. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> So I think it's helpful to like sort of just understand where things are from a 20,000 square foot level and have a good understanding of, you know, who's doing what and, and uh, where things are headed. This guy to my left, in my humble opinion, and I talk to literally every venture investor, every startup, uh, CTOs of all the brokerage firms and all the developers, this guy, this cat, is, in my humble opinion, the most impressive and knowledgeable thought leader in our world of commercial real estate tech. His name is Ellie Feingold, and I'm blessed to have him here with me today. How are you, my friend? Thank you for that unbelievable introduction. <laughs> Can I you actually, guys hear me okay? I actually okay. meant it. I actually meant it. Um, um, so Ellie and I, we met, um, I'd like to hear a little bit about his journey, probably 2011-12. CRE Tech was something that I had acquired a couple of years ago. In the very beginning, it was started by this, this fellow, Pierce Neinkin, who was at, uh, Is at CB. CB. Yeah. And it was like a volunteer community, right? People just like were enthusiastic about it. We would meet in Pierce's apartment in uh, San Francisco, and there was like 20 people, 30 people, 50 people. And Ellie was one of the earliest... Uh, thought leaders, uh, he was at CBRE, and I'll have him tell you his journey, running tech investment for CBRE, eventually went into, uh, became an angel investor, an advisor, uh, he's still doing a lot of that, and uh, now an uh, uh, entrepreneur in residence with Metaprop. With Metaprop, that's right. Um, so I thought we'd have just a, you know, sort of informal chat about trends and where we are and what have you, right? Sound good? Cool. Let's so why it. don't you tell everybody about, you know, sort of how you got to this place? Um, entirely by accident. <laughs> that would be the story. Um, so uh, I came out of college uh, a long time ago, uh, longer than, these, than most of the founders up here, uh, and started a tech company, exited that, and the next tech company I started uh, was a real estate tech company um, back when my competitors were uh, Excelligent, um, LoopNet, and Dennis DeAndre, Andy of CoStar. Um, See, that was a, that was a neutral <laughs> reference. Um, and, uh, and so, so we, were, we were building an online sort of list, listing and marketplace transaction engine. Um, we were eventually acquired by uh, Insignia Financial Group. I don't know if anybody remembers Insignia, but it was Andrew Farkas's vehicle that eventually got split up into various parts, and a lot of it became C part of what CBRE is now. Uh, and so when Andrew bought my company, I became the chief uh, innovation officer of Insignia. Um, so, which is a new position at the time, uh, and the idea of a commercial real estate company having an actual chief innovation officer uh, was, uh, was sort of a, a shocker. And unfortunately, that was right at the crash. So my first year, I spent mostly shutting down a bunch of, of ideas that had run out of money. <laughs> um, but it did give me, start giving me the perspective to look across the various ver parts of the industry, the various needs of the industry, and across various geographies. Um, we sold Insignia to CB in... 2003, I think, about 2003. And I left with Andrew and was a founding partner in Island Capital Group, which is now the parent company of C3 and NAI, um, and was the chief administrative officer there, and also um, was the president of definitely our coolest division, uh, a company called Island Global Yachting. Um, I spent uh, my late 20s and early 30s flying around the world building mega yacht marinas, um, only in the nicest places in the world. This did not suck, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but we deployed you know, over the course of, of the course of, of, of a few years. We deployed about a billion and a half dollars of capital, um, and bought it. Became relatively vertically integrated. Had about a thousand employees uh, globally. We built the marinas in the Palm Island in Dubai. Uh, we built marinas all over the Caribbean, Mexico, etc. Um, after exiting that, just before uh, this was the good timing exit. I exited that just before the, the crash, mm. um, and uh, after a couple years of letting my liver recover. Uh, I, came, I went back, uh, the guys at CBRE reached out uh, and asked me to come back as head of innovation globally for CBRE. Now, part of the reason was because back in the Insignia days, we had actually tried to form a partnership of what was then four of the big five, which was uh, uh, JLL, uh, Insignia, Trammell Crow, and CBRE, Cushman didn't want to play at the time. 
Um, and at the time, there's four of those five, or three of those five, obviously, sort of merged into CBRE. So the consolidation question earlier, we can get back to that at some point. Mm -hmm. um, so I knew a lot of the, a lot of the leadership. Um, that's when I moved to Texas. Woo! Um, <laughs> so I live in Dallas now. Um, and I ran, my, my job at the time was, in retrospect, kind of ridiculous, which was to oversee innovation for all of our business lines across all of our geographies. Um, and CBRE is a company of 85,000, 90,000 people um, in almost every major market in the world, a leader in almost every major market in the world, doing almost every single con part of the, res of the tr real estate transaction you can imagine. Um, and so I think part of it speaks to the, um, the change since then is that back then they thought that one guy could do that job, right? <laughs> and then, and, um, but it was a fantastic perspective. Um, I reported up to our global president, our global CFO, um, and we ran, did everything from work with a lot of the startups, the first generation of startups. And Michael Mandel, wherever you are, I cannot believe you did not give me Comstack socks. Yeah, all Comstack yeah, socks? Seriously. Really? Thanks. They're comp socks. <laughs> okay, comp, comp socks. socks. Uh, we'll um, anybody else who wants them, give me your business card. We'll <laughs> <laughs> So I spent a lot of time working with sort of the first generation of this wave of, of real estate companies with the VTSs and the high towers and the comp stacks and many of the others. Um, we also spent, I also spent a lot of time doing thought leadership pieces and talking to our customers um, in, about the impacts that technology was having on real estate, not only real estate technology, but other technology as well. Um, and then I spent a third of my time um, sort of having, getting to play startup in a sandbox. We had something called CBRE Labs. Um, we tested and built our own products and would run trials on them. Our job was to be two to three years ahead of the company. Um, and amazingly, um, although I left, left the company two years ago, a lot of the stuff that we were doing in the last year has now become core product offerings of the company. So it was actually a, it was a, it was a pretty successful run with a fairly difficult problem, although I still feel like I just scratched the surface. Right. So now, and I'm sorry this story got really long. No, that was amazing. Um, I've so, done none of that. So, uh, <laughs> Did you go to college? <laughs> um, I should exit now. I should just go. <laughs> what am I doing here? No qualifications. Look at this guy. Um, so, uh, so now I've uh, been doing some advisory M&A work uh, with old partners. Um, I'm the entrepreneur in residence at Metaprop, which is an accelerator and VC firm in New York that you may have heard of. Um, I am an advisor uh, formally and informally to a number of companies, some of whom are here today. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ryan Turner. <laughs> so, um, uh, and then um, I'm also working on some of my own initiatives, including um, raising an actually a Texas focused a tech a strategy real estate fund to actually buy real estate that we think is gonna benefit um, from some of the coming changes in technology. Wonderful, do you sleep? Not very much. Yeah, neither do I. That's okay. Oh, um, that's that's great, man. Drink. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so let's talk about like sort of where we are, right? So when I look at like, you know, when we met 2011, whatever, to today. So right now, every month, we're sort of tracking about seven, 800 million being invested in the sector every month. It's friggin' crazy, right? Um, and you know, there's thousands of startups. I mean, I don't know if it's anywhere. I've heard our friends at MIT say there's 7,000. We think there's 3,000. Somewhere in the middle, let's say it's 5,000. Um, and we're seeing just, in my opinion, great innovation in this space. And when I get asked a lot of times, like, are we in a bubble? I always say, I get, want to get your opinion. I say, no, we're not in a freaking bubble. I mean, when you look at who's investing, like Ellie said, CBRE, $20 million through Fifth Wall. And to, Metaprop, and to Metaprop. And to Metaprop. JLL, 100 million in Spark. Collier's, Techstars. Um, and then you look at Brookfield, a couple hundred million investing. RxR just announced, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 million dollar fund. Westfield, 200 Westfield. Million. Brandywine's now getting very active. Um, so there's great momentum in the space. When you think about sort of 2011 to 2018, what, what stands out in your mind as some of the, the major trends that, that we're seeing right, right now today, is it, in addition to all the money that's coming in? Yeah, well, I mean, I think, you know, I, I am concerned that there's a lot of money flowing into the, into the space um, that is way ahead of adoption mm -hmm. um, and consolidation. So um, do I think we're in a bubble? I'm not sure that I would use that term. Um, do I think that there is going to at some point be a relatively significant extinction event? Yes. Mm. Um, and so I don't, I don't know, know how those two align. Um, but I think there's a few megatrends. <laughs> Travis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
You know, it's typical to the VCs with their big dramatic entrances. <laughs> <laughs> Sid, no, 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 Sid. I'm gonna. Uh, flight got canceled. Came all the way down from LA, right? Were you in LA? Yeah, Where were you? In LA. Uh, my friend Travis Putnam of of uh, Navitas. Uh, in my opinion, also just an extraordinary thought leader. One of the the most active VCs in the space. Welcome, Travis. Thank you. Good to be. Thanks, great to be here. Sorry for <laughs> coming at the very last second. So we're just improvising and we're talking yeah. about where we are in the sector and what have you. Um, just give everybody a quick overview of uh, Navitas. Sure, so um, the venture fund focused on real estate and construction. We started in 2011. So we've been at this for uh, quite a while now. Um, raised the first fund back in 2011 of 20 million bucks and then closed our second fund uh, back in, well, about a year ago, uh, that was 60 million. Our focus is really around series, like kind of late seed, series A. Um, we've got you know pretty you know fantastic network of owners and service providers in the space that that uh, act as kind of uh, you know partners to our business that help the startups that we invest in. Um, and and you know over the last you know seven eight years we've built we probably made 20 to 25 investments. Um, and uh, uh, you know, really try and be a, kind of a partner of choice at that at that early stage when companies are going from having a, a product that's starting to work and some some interest in the market to really helping those companies differentiate themselves and establish you know begin to establish themselves as, as category leaders in their particular areas. So I'm like seeing Tom from Trust, and <laughs> I'm sure there's others here that I know, but it's great to be in Texas. I love Texas. Yeah, man. Thanks for coming. So we were just talking, Travis, about like. Uh, Ellie and I, you know, our, our journey of the last seven, eight years being in the ecosystem, and we're just talking about sort of where we think we are right now and what some of the important trends are that we were talking about. So you want to continue? So I, so I think that, um, let, me, let me pick out a couple and then Travis, you can tell me which, which ones I've missed. So I think one of them is, is the money. And all joking aside, um, what's previously happened um, in real estate tech cycles uh, is that there is a dip in the overall uh, secular economy um, and the real estate cycle dips and all of a sudden all the real estate co t tech companies kind of just get wiped off, wiped, off, wiped off the earth because they're the, they're the first things to go when budgets get cut. Um, one of the things I think is very different about this cycle is the amount of money that has been committed to and or allocated to um, real estate tech and I think it provides a much bigger sort of cushion to get a lot of those companies over the chasm of a, what happens if we have a really bad cycle. Mm. And I think that that is a fundamental change um, which for me, having now been sort of two, through two or three of these where I've watched everybody just get mm -hmm. washed out, um, that actually provides a great deal of hope because it shows, it shows commitment and there's actually money that has to be put out to support these companies. Um, I think, think one of the second things, that, second things that's a big thing is that you have um, what my colleague at Metapop, Zach Schwartzman, calls full stack companies entering the space. So for a long time, the big concern and one thing that we talked about a lot at CBRE and even back at Insignia was disintermediation, right? And what we're, what, where most of the capital, if you look at actually the number of dollars is flowing, is not toward disintermediation, it's toward a new kind of intermediary. Sometimes one that sits on top of the existing layer of intermediaries and sometimes one that competes directly head to head with them. And I don't think that we've really seen that before. And so I think that that opens a third fundamental opportunity, which is every incumbent in the world is scared to death mm. um, and is going to start looking for tools and ways in which to replicate and eventually get ahead of some of those, of those strong people. So uh, some, of those, some of those strong new market entrances, the compasses, the trusses, the, um, the door in Dallas, the, mm. you know, the WeWorks. Um, and so I think that that provides a, you know, there's, there's greed and then there's fear. Um, there's always greed. But now there's some fear. Yeah. And I think that that's really driving change and driving adoption for many of the large infrastructure, large institutional companies. Great. A great, great point. Travis, I mean, you guys, you, you know, you're, you're so prolific. I don't know that there's a, a more active VC in the sector right now than, than, than you guys. And you mentioned trust, a great investment. I know you just also uh, was a cherry. Uh, in terms of deal flow today, what are you seeing that excites you most about the current climate of opportunities from from a fund perspective? Yeah, I think the I think the thing that we've seen 
happen that's really exciting. It's not, it's not just volume, and the volume is there. I mean, I get asked this question all the time when we're out and having meetings, like, what's deal flow like? You guys, what's it, what's it like compared to what it was before? And it really has gone from being sort of a trickle when we first got, got started in the space to now, uh, you know, it's just there's just too many things to keep up with. So, you know, we've been building out our team to be able to kind of get through that and really focus on the right on the right deals. But I think the other thing that's probably even more important is just the quality of the teams and the experience of the entrepreneurs that are starting to come into this space. So, you know, management teams and founders that are repeat founders or that may be, you know, first time founders, but that aren't coming necessarily from our sector that are really starting to see that, hey, these are, you know, the largest asset classes and markets on the planet. You know, there's now a capital ecosystem in place to support these startups, not just at a seed or a series A stage, but, you know, the big generals VCs now are starting to come into the space in a major way. Um, and then, you know, to the likes of SoftBank, right? Like when you get up to right. kind of the later <laughs> stages, but like you look at their portfolio and like you could probably say half of it is now attributed to the, you know, yeah. to, to our yeah, space. Totally. So, the whole ecosystem is there now and set to build, you know, gigantic companies and, and the kind of capital that's needed, you know, to really um, support the space, which has its challenges, right? It does take time. It does, you know, there are some real issues around fragmentation and just adoption cycles, but I think the capitals are now to support it. So from our standpoint, you know, this is really a founder game and we want to back the best, you know, the best teams in the, in, in the sectors that have a chance to build big companies. And we're seeing the quality of that really improve, which is, which is fantastic for us. One of the things that, that I get inbound a lot uh, in my sort of position at running CRE Tech is I get a lot of early stage startups that are looking to enter the ecosystem. And a, lot, a bunch of them are here today. What advice would you give them in terms of how to look at the market, how to scale their product? Um, you know, you've seen so much, right, that's worked. We've got great speakers here today, great startups that have scaled. What advice do you give people that want to get into the sector now? Take that. Um, yeah, really hug your customers, like the early ones, and do things that don't necessarily scale, right? So just find find some customers that are friendly, that are willing to, to kind of experiment with you and you can make mistakes with. Mm -hmm. But that ultimately, like, really, you know, you have a relationship with or they, they, they have faith in you to get to where you say you can get to, but are also willing to kind of take some risks um, and, 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 move, and move at a pace that's not like, hey, you know, promise the, promise the world, hey, if you work with us, we can, you know, be huge, but we're going to take a year or two and just wipe you out in terms of right. just getting to a pilot. So go maybe don't go after the biggest brands and like the biggest companies out there. Go after that next tier that's looking for an edge, that's looking for something to be able to differentiate themselves, and that's willing to kind of work with you to get to that get to that first stage. That's I think that's really advice. important early on. Yeah, Ellie, what about you? You're advising, I know, a lot of startups. What is typically the advice that you're giving in terms of how to scale in this ecosystem? Oh, they each get different ones. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, so, I mean, I think the, fir the first thing, and I think Travis's point about people coming outside of the industry is, is, is dead on. Um, one of the things that I look for is places where you actually have a founding team that brings both tech experience and real estate experience, because that just doesn't exist in that many people. Mm -hmm. And so people who can, uh, teams that can actually evaluate the technical feasibility of what they're going to do, and then people who understand the real estate market, which is... Um, everybody, we don't like to say it's simple, but it's not. It's a very, very complex market to enter. If you make a misstep, everybody is going to talk and you're going to know about it. I, you, can't, you can't fuck up, right? <laughs> um, and so, so looking for teams that really bring you know, both sides of the equation, um, I, think, I think is really important. That's great. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about co-working, flex space. Um, Travis, you guys just invested in HQO, right? Big fans of their platform, if anybody... Uh, wants to see a great tenant uh, tenant amenity platform tenant. I think they call it like a tenant tenant experience. Tenant platform? experience. Tenant experience. Um, one of the phenomenons that's happening in the landlord community is, and you see it with Brandywine, uh, you see it with Boston Properties, you see it with Heinz, um, so many others. Is they're not they're not you know seeding uh, the uh, co working flex based uh, sector to WeWork anymore. You know, they're actively engaged in trying to build out those kind of products themselves. So you're seeing this whole ecosystem of tenant amenity uh, type of uh, apps and platforms like HQO prop up. What advice would you give to a landlord, both of you, today in terms of how they should be approaching tech, what they should be looking at um, for their portfolio and their company from a landlord perspective? Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, from the landlord perspective, I mean, I think the game has changed in terms of how there's power that's been given back to the, to the, to the people, the companies, the individuals that are consuming real estate. I think that's fundamentally what changed with WeWork, right? Offering oh, yeah. short-term, flexible, you know, highly amenitized, you know, culture on demand kind of services. You know, and, and um, you know, that really changed the way that, that, that people are now starting to get used to experience space. So from a landlord perspective, I think there needs to be a response to that. And I think a company like HQO and others in this kind of like tenant experience space are offering landlords a way to kind of have a response to WeWork. And, um, it, you know, it, it's, a, it's a mix of things. It's, it's, flexibility is, is one part of it. The other part is, look, if you're a landlord, right, you've got some fundamental advantages over a company like WeWork in a lot of ways, right? You've got incredible amenities already built into a lot of your properties. You've got the neighborhood around you that you're already like, part of that neighborhood fabric. So take advantage of that. Figure out ways to now kind of say, okay, WeWork, like you came and didn't, you know, you kind of, you trumped us a little bit here. Now we're going to come back and respond in a way that's going to offer our, our tenants amenities that you can't offer. And we're going to do that in a way that, that, um, you know, kind of ups the game on them. So that yeah. I think looking at platforms that are enable you to offer those types of services to your tenants is is something that's really valuable. And the second thing is around data. Like it, as soon as someone comes into into the walls of your building, like the, the landlord's in control, right? So to so recognize that and and take you know take advantage of that, right? The services that are coming in and out of your building are something that the landlords should be monitoring and uh, potentially monetizing. So I think we see a lot of new revenue enhancement opportunities in the space that go beyond just you know charging rent to, to tenants. Right, right. Uh, Elliot, from your point of view, coming from the brokerage side uh, for many years, what advice, we have a bunch of brokers that are coming here to the first time to a, a Siri Tech event. What advice do you give the brokers out there in terms of why they should be looking at tech, how they should get involved, how it should, you know, they could approach it to help their business. As individual brokers? Yeah, and firms too. Well, I'm going to start with the firms because I think that, um, and I'm going I'm to actually jump back off, off of Travis's, Travis's point because I think that we're in an interesting space where WeWork has conflated at least three separate, separate categories um, that, 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 are, that do have their differences. One is tenant experience, one is, is flex space, and one is co-working. Mm. And I'm not sure that all of those things need to be bundled together in the way that they're being bundled by WeWork. And I do think that landlords have a great opportunity to pick their spots and figure out whether they're going to partner mm. with, um, to, for, for each of those things, whether they're gonna partner, self-serve, um, but they're gonna, have to, they're gonna have to come up and address it, otherwise um, somebody else is gonna be taking the money. Mm. I also agree that the data is, is critical. Um, the amount of data that flows through when you actually know, you know, how people are moving through your building and your ability to be responsive to that and your ability to then drive investment decisions around that is absolutely staggering. Um, you know, right now, the most, you know, many buildings, most thing, things people know is how many cars go in and out, not even which cars, just how many cars go in and out. Um, and we have, uh, there's now the technology emerging to really know a lot more about your customers, mm -hmm. know a lot more about what drives them and what makes them happy. Um, and what drives them to, to create you know, decisions to buy from the local businesses in your building and in your neighborhood. Right, right. And how about the brokerage side? What, would, what advice do you give individual brokers as to how to get involved in this sector? So I think um, it, was, it depends. It's a very complicated question yeah. because, um, <laughs> they say, um, because there's brokers and brokerages, and they, yeah. I think they often have um, different goals. I think that um, I would say run to the bullet. Um, that would be my, my thing, which is technology is coming. Um, it's going to, the, the winners are going to be those who are able to figure out how to use, utilize that technology, utilize that data, and improve their client's experience as a result of it. Mm. Um, I do think that, you know, some of the smaller, in, in many areas, the smaller leasing is, it is already disrupted by WeWork um, and others. Um, so, the figure, so helping people figure out how to tie their, their corporate strategy to their real estate strategy is a really, really key component, and that's one that's driven by technology and data. Yeah, that's great. Um, finally, for me, you know, it's like w when I travel around the country and I start to talk, introduce people to what's happening in, in the tech sector, and I always talk about like that in the hotel industry, nobody saw Airbnb coming, and it had a profound impact. In the taxi, limo, whatever, nobody saw Uber. Uh, what Amazon's done to retail. I mean, it's, they've been profound in terms of changes. And WeWork did not invent this concept, right? But they really, I think, uh, perfected it so far. 
When you guys think about like what the future could look like, whether it's office or industrial, or it's whether it's just commercial real estate tech, what are some of like the big themes that you think about that are coming that could be truly transformative in the way that we all operate in the ecosystem? Sort of big ideas, big themes, things that are coming that you see in your uh, line of work. So I'll start with a, with a couple. Um, and I've been, for those of you who've seen me before, I've been talking about this for years, and I think that we're moving along the curve. Um, the combination of mobility, the service economy, and eventually transportation as a service and, and enabled by autonomy is going to be really big for real estate. That, that radical mobility has changed the way we work, right? And we can now work anywhere. Um, the sharing economy has created things like WeWork where we can share space and share common areas. And the transportation economy is going to affect the one thing that we thought never changes in real estate, which is location, location, location. And when you have a fundamental transportation shift, the value of locations change. And so I think that this is a large fundamental issue that um, people who are able to invest ahead of that curve are going to be, be able to do some, some, make some really interesting decisions. Um, a second area that I find absolutely fascinating um, is on the AEC, the construction side, um, where you have, in particular, the convergence of panelized modular construction along with large format 3D printing. I think those two technologies, once they get sort of mature and merge, are going to allow for um, some really interesting things to happen that may change the way that we think about how build, not only about how buildings are built, but about how long their lifespan is. Mm -hmm. right? If you can take it apart and put it back together somebody or somewhere else, that fundamentally changes the, the meaning of building in a certain way. And so I, I think that while that's a little further over the horizon, um, I think that one day that's going to be a, a major impact across all sectors of real estate. That's great. That's great. What well, do you those think? Are, those are great. <laughs> <laughs> um, what do you think? What's other yeah, I mean, look, I, the other one I would add to that, well, there's two I, I, would, I would talk about that I think are really exciting from our perspective. From our perspective. Um, one is just this, this, this concept of how real estate is valued, bought, and sold. Um, it's an area we've been spending a lot of time on, and, and in some ways it's connected to our investment in Cherry this last year. But... Yeah, you think about that, if you look at the stock market, right? Like almost half of trades now on Wall Street are done by computers, and that's done because you know you have. And it wasn't like I mean, it was a long time ago, but it wasn't that long ago, right? They used to have people kind of going back and forth on a trading floor, like handing pieces of paper, and it was much more efficient. I think that the future in real estate does end up somewhere like that to a certain degree. I don't know if it gets all the way there, but once you've got uh, the ability to kind of leverage machine learning and large data sets and start to connect this stuff, the ability to kind of programmatically trade real estate is something that I think will happen. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure how long it's going to take, but I think that's something that we're really excited about. Um, and then the other big one is just AI, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously connected to data again, but, but once you start to uh, be able to harness AI to run operations better, I mean, every, we know this, right, especially today in this like ultra low cap rate environment where every dollar of incremental revenue or a dollar saved is, you know, worth a lot more than that in terms of asset value. So, you know, owners being able to look at their operations and find ways to have computers do a lot of the kind of repetitive tasks that, that, um, today are done by humans, I, I think it's inevitable, right? Landlords are going to head this direction. We're already starting to see it play out in, uh, with a couple of different companies that are working on stuff and landlords that are ad adopting it. And I think that that's going to profoundly change just kind of the, maybe the, the economics of how, how real estate's valued and, and how you know, sophisticated owners start to, to take advantage of this stuff. And if I can, do you mind if I just jump on yeah. that? Because I, I, agree, I agree completely with AI. Um, I think it's going to be huge. I think it's going to take a little longer um, than, um, than some people expect. Um, I'm sure not longer than Travis expects, but longer than, than some people expect. Because there's really two things that go into, I mean, once, beyond the algorithm, there's two things that you need to do to make AI incredibly powerful. And one is feed it with a lot of data. And two is do a lot of reps with a lot of different outcomes and, try to, and start to optimize. Because that's, that's essentially what it does. It just runs it and, and optimizes it, runs it and optimizes it. And in real estate, we have, um, you know, we have we have data issues. Um, the transactions are relatively infrequent compared to. Right? So we've got, we've got. It may take a while in real estate, and I think you're going to start seeing it um, in some spot solutions, and then eventually those things are going to start merging into into broader platform, broader AI platforms that tie different knowledge data streams and uh, sort of reps reps done. Um, together to create that real, real sort of forward-looking value thing. I, I just add one other thing that I think is interesting. 
Like I think we'll probably start call, we'll stop calling people in our in our in companies in our properties as tenants, right? Like mm -hmm. this is subtle, but it's but it's like profound in a way, right? Like as as the hospitality type services start to make their way into office and multifamily and like these other asset classes, the way we think about it, the way that we're forced to like engage with you know the people that are paying rent. I mean, is is it's going to change. I, I think that's profound in a lot of ways because we're going to have to do things that service them um, in a way like airlines have had to learn how to do and like other industries have had to do. I read so. a great um, post the other day by another great thought leader, uh, Drawer Polek, if you know Drawer, yeah. and he said in the future he thinks that we're going to start trading on desks as opposed to square footage to that point, that that's how tenants are going to value um, their space. I just to, to the point about the AI. So one of the things that because we're all in this sort of very new ecosystem that I look at the, uh, for comps is fintech, right? And uh, if you just look at what's happened on the financial services sector, which is very similar to ours in a sense, it's largely B two B. It's big dollars. It's a lot of risk involved. Complicated transactions. And I. Part of like when, when I sort of give my narrative, as I say, if you look at Goldman Sachs, for instance, right? I think it was six, eight years ago, they had 800 equity traders on, on this one desk, okay? Five, six years later, they had two. But they replaced them with 200 quant engineers to do the trading. And so like you look at those industries and those comps and you go, you're right. Like, there's fundamental change that's coming. And it is, you know, listen, I'm probably the oldest fucking person in the room. <laughs> it's never too late to get started and just start to embrace uh, the ecosystem because change is definitely coming. I think it's coming from the tenants. I think it's coming from the investors. Um, it's coming from a generational change. So, um, and, this, and, and I think, ahead. you know, I've sort of, I, there's, I think there are good parallels to fintech, and there's some places where real estate is fundamentally different mm -hmm. because to me, um, the places that are most ripe for disruption are the places where the transactions are frequent, mm -hmm. where the unit volume is, rel or the value is relatively small for the customer, mm -hmm. um, and there's some degree of standardization about mm -hmm. the product. And real estate isn't there yet. Right. Um, I mean, at some point we may get there into you know the blockchain securities and the stuff that Harbor is doing um, on the Harbor. back end, but yep. on the front end, it, that's that's going to take a while. Um, because generally, for many of the customers, these real estate transactions are the biggest transactions they'll make in their company. Um, and it is a very personal decision about culture and location and labor analytics. Mm -hmm. And so while I do think that there is a lot of disruption coming, I think that there's a parts of real estate that are not going to get sort of swept away mm -hmm. that quickly um, because companies, com you know, especially with the big corporates, for the, whom real estate is, it's a piece of their brand, it's a piece of their identity, it's a piece of their culture, and it, they see it as a piece of their competitive right. advantage. Although, anybody here from JLL? What did you see? They, they, they're calling themselves now a tech firm. So <laughs> it's all coming. It's coming full circle pretty quickly. Anyway, that's it. That's it for me. What about some questions from the audience for these two amazing thought leaders? My friend. Go ahead. Taj. Yeah, Taj, go ahead. A um, question about the new technologies. We talked about the future. I don't know if anyone's really addressed blockchain, crypto. Is it overhyped? I'm glad you didn't say scooters, Watching. Michael. <laughs> if you, so, <laughs> Wait for scooters. Uh, go to, go to, if you go to the website, we just published a white paper on yeah. kind of blockchain and crypto applied to real estate and some of our thoughts on that. But first, I get to separate the two. Right? Blockchain is fundamentally different than crypto. So is crypto overhyped? In my opinion, yes. Right? I think it's pure, pure speculators' market. Like, there's money to be made there. I think if you know what you're doing, but it's. You know, you're trading a very risky asset. Blockchain, as it relates to real estate, is totally different. I think we're really excited about the future applications for it. It is, you know, highly, highly complicated, and there's lots of like fundamental issues that still need to be addressed. But there's also, you know, the first tokenized assets that you know have been kind of put on the market recently, and companies like Harbor and, and others that have raised significant amount of money and are working really hard on this problem with, with, with some serious people behind it. So I think you'll start to see you know, some, some movement around that. Um, I, would, I certainly wouldn't dismiss blockchain as it you know, relates to our sector. It's just the question of whether it's going to take five years, 15, 20. Don't, don't really know at this point. Ellie? Is it somewhere between you know, behind AI or ahead of AI? 
I, I think AI is a little bit ahead in our view. Yeah. yeah. I would agree. And I mean, I think there's, um, you know, I, I, I sort of imagine, I mean, there's, there's people, there's a bunch of uses for blockchain and real estate. One of them is essentially creating a securities market that is highly liquid, which is what Harbor and those guys are doing. And I think that that has, um, that, that may have an impact sooner than we think. Um, although maybe not at the scale it's going to take, I think it may take a while. Um, the other place that it's useful, of course, is for um, tracking data, tracking things like access controls and everything else and creating secure systems around that. Um, I think that's going to take a little longer because that's going to have to be more deeply embedded in the processes. But at some point that's going to be, you know, we were talking about how one of the most valuable assets you're going to have as an owner is your data. Well, how are you going to track which data is yours um, and how are you going to assign rights to it? And I think the blockchain is a, is a, is, is great for that. That said, I mean, you know, I saw somebody uh, firm the other day that announced that they were doing something on IBM's blockchain, which is kind of weird because the whole idea behind blockchain is it's a distributed, liver, led, distributed yeah. ledger technology. Um, and so IBM's blockchain, it's pretty much just on a server, uh, on their, on their, on, on, or at least on their cloud. Um, and uh, I also want you guys to know I have an alter ego. I, may, I, I, I do a, a rap album. And under the name under the name blockchains, the Z, and uh, all I do is I show up at events and stand in the back and scream blockchain. <laughs> I have a question. Have you seen that? Have you seen that? Got, I've, got, yes. I've got an album cover. Uh, adding on to the blockchain conversation, what's fascinating uh, I guess making it specific to me from a new business development leasing asset manager role. I've been trying to figure out where this tokenization of real estate assets is going to go and where the opportunities are. Maybe it's too early, but do you have any thoughts on that? Where the, uh, this, at the end of the day, the, the brokers, the sales folks, the best managers can make money in that and mm. try and find the winners to find out things to go into that area? Good one. I'll be honest. I think that. Aside from the sort of the new, the newly liquid markets that are being created and are just coming to market. I mean, when we, we talk about them just coming to market, I think the first tokenized asset just went out a couple weeks ago. Um, I think that aside from that, it's, it's, it's still very, very, very early. Um, and I, I would not be too focused on that, on that, on that. Blockchain at the end of the day is going to be background technology powering solutions. And we're still in the figuring out how to use the background technology. I think when it gets to the solutions is when you need to start sitting up and paying attention. But I'm just not sure we're there yet for the, for the end user. Uh, Travis, do you agree? Maybe. Yeah, I think so. Uh, that, yeah, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't know a specific area. I, if you if you may be in a way of kind of trading and creating a market in these newly liquid secondary markets that leverage blockchain, but I, I think it's. Yeah, look, I, 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 do, I think that is kind of that, like, if you look at Harbor, what, yeah, the, look what at these Harbor. companies are doing, right? I mean, they are, they're, 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 you know, kind of programming these assets into, into tokens, but then they also have to create a secondary market, right? Like, that, the, the reason to have these tokens is to be able to get in, to create liquidity, get in and out of them. So, you know, in a lot of ways, it's like, uh, you're, you're kind of a mixture between a, a digitized law firm and a um, securities broker, so... And they have, they still have to comply with, with federal securities rules. So you know, the, you still have to have your accredited investor in status. Status. Um, so I think it, while it makes a, while it makes a complicated process more efficient, relative to the value, I'm not sure that it's actually that huge of a jump until it gets to scale. One more. Good. What do you got? Somebody. Yeah. I mean, I don't know about from a technology perspective, but as an investor, I love opportunities. <laughs> no, there's a huge, huge opportunity there. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Taylor Scotland. Go, bud. This is for you. So, for a lot of the, the tech companies in the space, the engaging with the big five big firms, at what point do you think there's going to be a shift in the build versus buy philosophy? So you engage, you know, a technical group and a CTO and they see platform, the more job is incredible, and you've got 40 teams already using it. And then they go, well, we're going to take it in house and spend 20 million and try to build it ourselves. When do you feel like that shift may truly happen? Well, I'm not sure. I'm, first of all, I'm not sure that it is actually one or the other right now. I think that firms are trying. Sorry, sorry. The question was um, when are the big, um, particularly service provider platforms, the big global providers, um, when are they going to start move? I'm not sure if it was moved from building to buying or buying to building. 
um, because I think right now it's a hodgepodge of both. Um, what I do think you're going to see is, you know, I, I will tell you, having been inside, been inside one of these at the top levels, that build versus buy is the least of our problems, of the problems mm. of those companies. It's how do you deploy right. and create standardization um, and actually get engagement at, across a giant global platform where the fundamental issue is not only that it's giant and global, but that people are doing business slightly differently in every different market. Um, so I think that the first things that these firms are going to have to solve is the adoption issue, and then they can get to figuring out what they build and what they buy. Um, and and that, that's going to be an entirely different set of decision making. But anybody who tells you that the big firms are actually deploying these things effectively globally yet, they're working on it, but it's very hard and they're not there yet. So it's great. Okay. Hopefully this was helpful. Thanks, Travis. Thanks, Ellie. Yeah. These Thank are uh, the best, the best, the best. Hey, so um, I just want to, one, one thing for everybody goes, I just want to get Ryan back up. And I just want to thank him again for organizing this. And thank you all again for coming so much. Thanks, buddy. It was great. We'll be here for a little bit. Grab a drink, grab a snack, make a new friend, ask a good question. Thanks for coming out. Talk to the startups. How do I get this out?
All right, welcome back, everybody. My name is Phil Wilhelm. We are here at CRE Tech in downtown Austin, Texas. Uh, this CRE Tech event is being sponsored by a number of awesome amazing companies, companies that are on the forefront of that combination between the commercial real estate sector and the technology sector. And I'm thrilled to have one of those sponsors here with me. Uh, this is Mr. Mike Clark from Real Massive. Mike, how are you? I'm doing great. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming out. And um, so Mike, I wanna hear a little bit about your, your company and how you guys are positioned within the entire um, commercial real estate and tech space. But, uh, you know, first a question about your background. You know, I, I noticed that you um, have been in the, the finance world for quite a while. You were a successful CFO in a number of finance and being a CFO and come to a company like Real Massive and do the, the CEO and president role. Well, it's a good question. I mean, I've had the opportunity to work for some really nice companies uh, in the CFO role. And uh, the great thing about that role is it's very operationally focused. You get a view of the entire business and particularly the roles I've had the last 10 years have been very operationally heavy. So um, great accounting teams under me, but my focus has really been on, on business operations, improving efficiencies, things like that. So it was kind of a natural progression uh, into this role. I'm really excited to be here. Awesome. And then how long was Real Massive um, around before you joined the, the company? So they were formed in late 14, 2014. Um, so just about four and a half years. Yeah. Awesome. And in talking with the founders of the company, um, what was it that they saw back in 2014 um, that, that was the genesis for the idea for the company? So I think the main thing, and you'll hear this theme throughout all the CRE tech, is just the the technology movement in the industry in general. You know, uh, commercial real estate's traditionally been, you'll hear this behind the curve on, uh, as far as technology goes. Um, real Massive is really formed around the premise of having an open platform, an open marketplace, right. uh, where data is exchanged uh, freely uh, and openly between the brokers. And that's not traditionally been the model in CRE. So um, that was really the premise. And uh, you know, we're definitely gonna continue with that model. And we're also expanding some other products into the data side of CRE. So mm -hmm. it's a really exciting time for, for commercial real estate. I think you're only, only gonna see technology improve uh, the whole industry over the next few years. Yeah, we, we totally agree. And um, could you give uh, an overview of the company size? How many how many employees do you guys have? Uh, how big is the company? Yeah, we're we're still small. We're about twenty five employees, and then we do have an outsource uh, dev arm as well for for about another ten developers. So about a thirty five equivalent. Awesome. All right. So uh, talk about some some strategies for for growth. As the CEO leading the charge, what have been some of those strategies over the last two to three years that have really propelled your company's growth? I think Real Massive is no different than any other company or industry that I've been in. And with this question, I mean, it's really about creating value for the customers, and you've got to be customer focused first. Understand what their problems are and solve those problems. And so there's lots of problems to be solved in commercial real estate, and commercial real estate is is broad. Um, you know, you can't really say commercial real estate and mean one single thing. There's so many different angles and pockets and, and niches within the market. So for us, there's a lot of opportunity, but as a startup, and we still consider ourselves a startup, you know, four sure. and a half years in, uh, is really being focused. You know, we've got to pick a few things, do them better than anybody else in the market, uh, be great at operational efficiency, drive that value to the customer, uh, and, and good people in the company really helps, you know. So hiring good people is what every startup needs to do. And because the commercial real estate um, sector is so big, the ecosystem is rather complex, how do you describe who your customers are? Who are your customers? So we have a, a little bit of a broad scope there. So the commercial real estate broker is definitely for our marketplace. So our marketplace is the centerpiece of Real Massive, um, but we also have a lot of data. And so there are a lot of customers and consumers of data in the commercial real estate space. So be that be government agencies, real estate investors, insurance companies, financial institution, they all have a role. Uh, you know, their businesses are all tied to commercial real estate in some way. Uh, and data uh, is sought by all of them. So yeah. Um, Awesome. And um, so I'm sure it's not all rainbows and, and sunshine. Uh, clearly, there's there's challenges along the way. What have been some of those challenges for, for you guys? I think the biggest challenge for, for an early stage company is getting traction, you know, having focus. And so that's what we've been trying to do the last uh, 12 to 18 months is really hone in our strategy, focus on a few things. You know, we can easily get distracted and try to do 10 things or 20 sure. things. Um, but any startup in any industry really needs laser focus. The second component is you've 
got to have great people. And those first 10, 20 people that you hire are the most important people you're going to hire in, in your company. And so my advice would be, you know, go for A players across the board. And, and you can't really afford to have B and C players on your team when you're so small because you yeah. don't have a lot of room for errors and mistakes or uh, getting your products to market. Yeah, it's, it's a really good point. Uh, would you mind talking a little bit about the culture? Um, how do you describe the culture of, uh, of Real Massive? And what are some maybe core values that are super important to all of those A players at your company? Yeah, so our culture, if anyone's familiar with uh, the Austin tech startup world and tech, it's very much, uh, I mean, you come into our office, it's one big room. So we have no private offices in terms of just the look and feel. You're in, in, a, in an open office and on right, I don't have a special office. None of my executives do. We're right shoulder to shoulder with every employee in the company. So very it's, cool. it's very open. We, you know, we don't hide our strategy. We're very open with the company, with, with the employees. The other key thing is really putting their needs first. You know, I want to have a culture where they come, they're excited about what we're doing. We could hire people. You know, we can hire people who have technical expertise in certain roles, but the key for us is having someone who gets our vision and strategy and really wants to come to Real Massive and they're excited to be with us. Those are the people we want, want to have. Yeah, I, I love that. All right, so last question, and it's a question that we've talked about uh, many times here tonight at the CRE Tech and Founders Grove Capital event, and that's around the evolution of the tech and commercial real estate space. Uh, Mike, where are we in that evolution? Are we early on? Some people earlier used a, a baseball analogy. So if you were to use a baseball analogy, what inning are we in? I think you'll hear, and you might have heard the conference, some people say we're in the first inning, we're in the second inning. That's about as far as I would go, second inning at the latest. That's pretty I, early. I think we're super early. You know, one statistic that, that we heard tonight was, you know, back in 2012, about 30 million dollars came into into the tech world and CRE tech and, and last year about six billion dollars of capital flowed in. Capital is flowing in for a reason. There's a digital transformation taking place in the commercial real estate industry and it's going to continue. You're going to see winners and losers over the next few years. You'll see consolidations. Uh, but the key thing is to, for us is to focus on our value proposition and make sure we deliver on that. Uh, treat our people well, treat our customers well, and, and we're excited for the future. Awesome. And, and you have been uh, treating all of your customers very well. The growth is tremendous. So, uh, Mike, congratulations on all Thank of your you. success at, at Real Massive. It. That's great. All right. Um, if you could step over to the, to the side here, we have one more person that we are going to bring up, and that's Mr. Scott Harmon of Swivel. And while uh, Scott is coming up here, wanted to give a, a quick mention to Kate and Mary Francis and Heidi and little JJ uh, that are watching. I know you would rather be watching the Astros right now in the World Series, but we were not able to get it done against the Red Sox. Uh, but next year, we will all be watching them together. Uh, and here he is, here's Scott. Scott, how you doing? I'm doing well, how are you? I'm doing uh, just fine, thanks. Um, you enjoying the event so far? It's really a good event. It's it is. good at the food, the everything. It is. There's a little liquor out there too. I, but yeah. I know. Well, we won't keep you here long. There's a lot of people out there in, yeah. in the in front of the main stage to talk mm -hmm. with. But um, I, I just wanted to go through uh, some some questions around Swivel, mm -hmm. and I, I think your uh, one of your descriptors of, of the company is around uh, the totality of all of the costs for creating a cool workspace. That, yeah. that phrase, cool workspace, yeah. seems to be really um, ingrained in, in your culture. Can you talk a little bit about the notion of a cool workspace? Yeah, I'll, you know, you have to cut me off, but that, so that, you know, and we picked that work intentionally because sure. as you, we focus on smaller companies, mostly high tech companies. Yep. Uh, a lot of them here in Austin. A lot of them here in Austin, some at this event that, uh, and the typical company would be a company that maybe has outgrown a WeWork or a co-working space. They're, they're energetic, they have a lot of recruiting, and so they want a high quality, cool, vibrant, uh, open, engaging workspace. That's what they want. Now the problem is they have a startup budget. Yeah. And so ordinarily, once you leave a WeWork, then you have to go be in the furniture business and understand how to put a kitchen together, find really neat spay, it's it's really not your core competence. Yeah, I, I'm a smart guy and I know how to do none of what you just described. Right, right. So, so cool just kind of captures the word for people that say, yep, that's what I want. I don't want to spend three months doing it. And can this business, can this website help me come up with a wicked cool web, or website, uh, office space. Yep. Uh, in a fraction of the time, and that's that's what's captured the imagination, I think. And, and uh, also, I saw in some of your materials the the visual representation of the iceberg yeah. is oh, a great 
um, way for, for people to think about what they might be getting into um, if they're going to move into a larger office space. Yeah, you know, that came up, same thing, conversation with the customers. Just like you said, you know, you know a lot of things, but once you get into doing an office, people are shocked at how, how much it costs. Yeah. You know, and I hear people say, I have no, and I'll give you just a silly example. Sure. Uh, plants, I'm looking at your plants over here, very nice plants. Yeah. Offset, but people say I didn't know how much plants cost. How, or, how much are plants? What, what is with that? Three hundred and fifty bucks a month for a live plant service. It's That's a lot a, of money. It's pretty steep, unless you get it through Swivel, which is a little cheaper. But, of course. Uh, but the cost of doing an office is like an iceberg, where the the costs you think about are maybe just the furniture, which can be quite expensive. But then all the other things that go into making making that place cool and authentic and expressing your culture, those things can cost three or four times as much as the things. Wow. above the water and so it, it's easily can be uh two hundred fifty thousand dollars or more even for a small office for a 30 person company That's, it's, it's it a lot really big huge, huge investment yeah. so yeah. how did you get into this space could you tell us a little bit about your background yeah i think i think maybe the easiest exp way to convey that is sort of that phrase physician heal thyself right so okay. i have rented uh so much you know i've been in austin for 25 years is the fifth technology company I've been part of, uh, of forming and putting together and I've I've gone through this process myself and and I'll just confess I'm not always put together the coolest most cost-effective office space okay and so I basically just got so tired of of you know how difficult it was how expensive it was and and kind of how bad I was at some of this and employees get frustrated and then you see these really awesome workspaces and I thought, well, why can't people have their own private version of that? And so it really came out of my own experiences of trying to build companies, set up office space and kind of always disappointing everyone. Sure. And I thought, you know what? Technology can fix this. So, so that's, that's why we were motivated to start Swivel. So does your company have the coolest office space in, in Austin? How do, I'm assuming you guys had some built-in competitive advantages in putting together your own space. And, yeah. how, and how big is the company as well right now? Yeah, so the company's um, early stages, we're just a year old. We've got about 10 folks and we're all technology geeks. And so what's different about Swivel is we actually, unlike, let's say we work, we don't actually go rent and finish out offices in advance. We only do it when you come to our website and you design the space you want for your company and when you do that, then we go build that space for you. That is so, such a cool, a cool value proposition. That is yeah. so unique. Yeah, so it's like just in time maybe. So so the idea is everyone is custom tailored only when you come to the website. Mm -hmm. So we've done about eight of them so far um, for eight different individual companies. We've got about another 25 companies that are on, on the waiting list to say, I want you to build one for me. And so we're, we build them one at a time in different places around. Some of them are downtown, some of them are East Austin. Uh, and every, everybody seems to be delighted so far, so we're really excited about it. Love it. And uh, could you talk about some of the, the strategies that you've already employed for your company uh, that are fueling some of, some of the growth? You know, I think the biggest strategy is really, um, it's, it's really a web, kind of a web-centric philosophy. And the idea is, it's sort of like kind of the Amazon effect. Mm. You know, you could buy anything on Amazon. Maybe sure. you could argue you could buy too much on Amazon, but but why does buying an office need to be so complicated when I can go to Amazon and buy almost anything and have like, and so how can you take this process that's kind of offline and make it almost as convenient as buying something on Amazon? So really making it a, a complete online web-based experience. And so we spent a lot of time on the website and just the, the experience from front to back. And that's really our, what we get really passionate about is making it really easy to come by. And when you come out the back, you end up with your own office space, tailor-made. I, I love that. Um, can you talk about some of the obstacles that, that your company has faced early on? I mean, you're you're yeah. essentially asking for your, your customers to change their approach, to yeah. change their way of thinking. Yeah. So what challenges have you seen with that? You know, that's a great, it's a really good question. Um, the normal way that you go to procure office space is you hire a broker. Yep. And, and so it does, uh, and with Swivel, even though we do partner with brokers and there are some innovative brokers at this event that we love to work with, you, you don't need a broker to work with Swivel. You can come to Swivel and you can, you can skip the commission and you can you know, save money on that and get your own office space. Yep. So getting people comfortable with finding a space without a broker is, is a change. That's a shift. And, uh, and it, frankly, it's, it's, it's almost a generational thing. So millennials, a lot of them will be like, what's an office broker? 
That's funny. You know? Yeah. And then sometimes that. people are like more on my age are like, where's, you know, I got to have my broker. Yeah. So that's, that's a kind of a cultural thing we're working through yeah. to make sure everybody's comfortable. Awesome. Uh, well, we'll end with a question that we've asked some, some of the other folks here tonight, and that's around the evolution of the commercial real estate and tech um, sectors. Mm -hmm. And where are we with that whole evolution? How early on are we? Uh, and, and what do you expect to see next? Yeah, I'd say first or second inning. That's probably not, I'm not the first person to say that. I think at the highest level, I think we're going to see two things change slowly. And we're, I'd say we're in the first or second inning. The first is, I think people who own assets and office buildings have to get comfortable with renting them on much more flexible terms. Just gonna, that's going to okay. happen. And uh, I think five or 10 years from now, I think it's going to be, you're going to be able to go rent small chunks and do it flexibly. And then I, the, the other thing is I think people, the brokerage industry is going to have to adopt, adapt, because okay. it's a technology world. And I love brokers, but they're going to have to uh, embrace a more tech-centric buying process. Yeah. I think if they're going to stay relevant. Yeah, it's a bit, bit antiquated right now. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's a fair statement. Yeah. Um, all right, well, one more question. What advice do you have for, uh, uh, for the folks watching uh, when they are considering upgrading their office space or, or a startup, a tech startup in there? dipping their toe in the water what should what should they consider well I guess you know obviously I hope they check out our website but even if they don't use swivel uh, I would say do try and add up the costs yeah uh, and if it's not from us and we have some resources on our website but just you know ask anybody and say I want to build a spreadsheet and really what is this really going to cost me uh, and sort of try and go into it with your eyes open because it's 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 probably going to cost you a lot more if you don't attack it the right way. It's great advice. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, I think that'll do it for us. Let's go in there and, and get uh, maybe a beverage and one of those there you go. wild mushroom turnovers. Those things I are delicious. Really had those. They're, they're, they're quite delightful. All right, everybody. Uh, this has been Phil Wilhelm for CRE Tech and Founders Grove Capital. Have a wonderful evening. Godspeed.